Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're just going to give it a few minutes to let all the participants join, and then we will make a start. Maybe uh, in the interest of time, we'll probably kick everything off. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Matt Hastings. I'm the Deputy Director of the Ofgem Strategic Innovation Fund. Um, huge thanks to all of our speakers joining today and all of the participants as well for the round two discovery phase show and tell webinars. Um, this is the first of a number of different sessions where we can look at a wide variety of different types of projects. And this one is obviously focused on the control room of the future. So next slide, please. And again. So I just very quickly want to run through um, the SIF in terms of vision, mission and strategy and give you a quick update on where we are so far. So many of you will know this already, but for those who don't, um, the Strategic Innovation Fund is a £450 million fund paid for by consumers on their energy bills. And we're really focused on network innovation, obviously, which is about not just helping the networks, but helping network users and consumers as well. So far, we've invested nearly £20 million through the sort of round one uh, discovery and alphas and into the round two discoveries, we're really pleased that we've identified potential benefits here. Uh, if you include some of the round one beta projects, which haven't yet been funded uh, in excess of sort of three billion pounds of consumer savings, as well as over two million tons of potential carbon reduction. So credit to all of the participants in the projects. We're definitely on the right track uh, to delivering significant value for money for consumers. Uh, next slide, please. So you can think about the <laughs> in terms of the vision that we're trying to achieve. It combines both Ofgem's vision as well as Innovate UK's. <clears throat> so it's about consumers, it's about net zero, it's about cost, but it's also about business and establishing the UK as the Silicon Valley of energy. We really want to see high growth potential businesses coming through the fund. <clears throat> and our mission is very simple. We're here to help people, we're here to help the planet, and we're here to help businesses as well. So that's kind of the clear focus of the fund. Next slide, please. In terms of our strategy, it's divided into what we do and how we do it. The what has these three boxes in it and the how has four. Um, the three boxes are the what, alignment, responsiveness and commercialization. What do they mean? We like to align across different funders. So we work very closely with other government departments, as well as other regulators uh, and across UKRI and Innovate UK. We also like to work with other sectors. So we're really keen to bring in uh, innovators from across uh, different sectors, whether that's from defense, whether that's across health tech or um, agri tech, or even sort of into uh, a wide variety of other sectors as well. And crucially, we like to align with regulatory change. So, Ofgem are very keen to see innovation adapt in uh, regulation. Uh, and that's the partnership that really can enable that through the Ofgem Innovation Hub. Secondly, in terms of responsiveness, as you know, we deliver four roughly £20 million challenges every single year, and we will do that every year for the remainder of the price control. And then delivering across discovery, alpha and beta, enables us to take a lot of risk in the discovery phase. And you'll hear about some of these really ambitious projects during discovery in a minute. Um, but the plan is to kind of de-risk those by the time we get to beta so that when we're investing large amounts of consumers' money, uh, they have a higher likelihood of it succeeding, albeit it, acknowledging it is still innovation and not everything is going to work. And then finally, around commercialization, we're not really into just funding projects. We're into funding products and services that consumers can actually use. And that's why the commercialization function is so important to really ensure that these businesses can translate into <coughs> procured contracts, which the networks can deliver for the benefit of consumers. Next slide, please. And then the final one for me is just around uh, the how of our strategy, which we, we term giant leap together which essentially is these four different stages. It's an annually recurring process, uh, which starts with challenge setting and sort of problem identification. That's something we do at the beginning of this year. And for those who haven't seen, we've recently announced our round three challenges uh, a week or so ago, which uh, kind of is the culmination of that effort for round three. We then move into ideation, which is where we can put great innovators in front of the networks and really start to seek out those really disruptive innovations that are going to massively move the needle for consumers. The third phase of the year is around incubation, where we work with innovators and the networks to help them form their consortia. And then finally, we've got acceleration in Q4, where we open up the challenges uh, for actual application. 
And we also have the Energy Innovation Summit, um, as well as that complements the Energy Innovation Base Camp at the beginning of the year, which is about problem identification. So um, big thanks to everyone for joining. That's all I wanted to say. I'll now hand over to David Richardson. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Matt, and good morning, everybody. My name's David Richardson. If we could skip onto the next slide, please. I'll be hosting the show and tell this morning. And firstly, I'd just like to set the context of what's been done for anybody who might be new to the process. Um, we have three phases, as Matt um, spoke about through the Strategic Innovation Fund. This is the second round, but the first phase we're at the end of. Um, we term that the discovery phase. Each of the projects have had um, around two to three months to be working on their problem identification, really understanding the needs of their users and doing analysis of the various solutions that might be able to um, complement those problems. They're generally reasonably small teams at this point looking at feasibility. Each project has received around 150,000 in strategic innovation funds, um, monies to put towards this. And as I say, they've been working together to get to this point. During the show and tell sessions, we're going to have a look back and have the context of the problem presented to us and also learn about all the findings through the duration of this. So I'd like to thank all the project teams who I know have had a really fast turnaround on getting these outputs produced um, and are now looking forward to the next phase. But um, I'm just looking forward to hearing what everybody's got to say, and I'm sure you are too. To give a brief overview of what we've got for you this morning, we're really focused on a session which is around the control room of the future and how do we manage system resilience under extreme events, but also support the most vulnerable consumers as we go through it. We will be taking a break halfway through the morning, but f first up, we've got three projects for you. Um, they come from National Grid Electricity System Operator, Northern Power Grid, and UK Power Networks. The first one will be looking at scenarios for extreme events. I won't spoil that too much because we'll be moving on to it very shortly. And then afterwards, we'll be looking at projects from Northern Power Grid, which look at how we use distributed energy resources to better support or self-support consumers and also support those around them. And then finally, we'll move on to the project from UK Power Networks, which will really be looking at weather alerts and how network operators can better manage risk by understanding weather events better. But with no further ado, I'll hand over to the first project. Please do ask any questions in the Q&A box, because we will be having a Q&A session at the end of each um, presentation. You can introduce yourself and do networking in the chat box as well, but any questions that you have, please pop in the Q&A box so that we can keep track of it. So I'll hand over to the ESO team um, with David McLennan and, and others. If we can move on to the next slide. And one more, please, Cohen. Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Just double check. Yep. Clear. Good. Good morning. My name is uh, John Zamet Harbour. I'm the senior, uh, so the Energy Security Senior Manager at the Electricity System Operator. Um, what I'll do this morning is I'm going to quickly run through the project drivers the, of the um, scenario of extreme events, and then be handing over to David, who will sort of go through the um, challenges and approach. Uh, Luke will then talk a bit more in detail about the discovery at Save its face, uh, the, the discovery phase itself. We just want to go to the next slide, sorry. So hopefully that will just, yeah. So hopefully just uh, outline what we're going to do um, in the next 15 minutes. Just want to move on to the next slide. Okay, so um, the ESO we have um, in the past looked at a number of different high impact, low probability events but normally around a particular event and normally driven by a particular need. Um, very quickly, uh, looking at those events, because given the interdependencies, it becomes very complicated to actually fully understand the impacts of a particularly extreme event on GB and on society. Given this sort of changes in global warming, uh, geopolitical events, 
it's understood that the reoccurrence of some of these events, these extreme events, will change going forward, with a number of these events expected to actually be a lot more frequent in the future. This is actually going to be in parallel to the continued rapid change in the GB energy system with a, a continued move towards decarbonisation and decentralisation, while at the same time increase in the dependency on electricity by society. There's also, many of you might be aware, um, a proposal for the future system operator. And one of the new roles under that um, will be something called the Office of Resilience and Emergency Management. One of the key activities of this new role will be to regularly evaluate the resilience of the GB energy system to different events and different extreme events, both to understand the current level of resilience to these events across GB and to society, but also in looking forward into the future, how the same events might also impact us in 2035, 2050, you know, modeling the different the changes in the energy system. The, this will allow us then to make relevant recommendations and undertake actions to ensure, first of all, the, the continued level of resilience that we have today, but where it's believed necessary to actually improve the resilience to these events where it's deemed um, justified. So this project um, is actually quite a key part of achieving that aim. With that, I'll hand over to David, who will go through a bit more detail about the approach. Great, thank you, John. If you could click on the slide. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly introduce and try and set some of the scene in terms of the project challenges. So uh, as John's already introduced there, uh, if we take the GB uh, energy system, uh, we can consider it as quite a complex network of, of interdependent assets uh, that are all interconnected. Uh, and and Aishwarya and our team has pulled together this uh, useful graphic that, that kind of outlines the complexity of, of the energy system. So. Um, if we think about a, a, a single extreme event, uh, a single extreme event could impact multiple assets in many different ways. Similarly, a single asset failure uh, or a system failure can be caused by a number of different events. So how, how do we actually uh, understand this? On, on top of that, you have an added complexity of compound events, uh, compound effects of multiple events can all combine to have a greater impact uh, than, than a singular event on its own. Uh, so what we're trying to unpick here is, is kind of have a whole system view and it needs to be a simplified whole system view, which we'll come on to in subsequent slides. We want to try and categorize what kind of extreme events are uh, and, and what their impact can be in, in varying degrees of severity, duration and, and localized areas. Um, we then want to understand, in terms of the dependencies within these this network of assets, which assets are, are dependent on, on upstream assets and, and downstream assets, uh, and what is the vulnerability in terms of uh, a potential cascade failure of, of these assets leading to ultimate system failure. Uh, and, then, and then finally, it's, it's kind of trying to understand uh, what existing resilience, the, the networks by design are inherently uh, resilient to to business as usual activities, uh, and that, that is that is built into their design. So, how do we represent that in any kind of model that we 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 hit with these uh, extreme events? If we click on to the next slide, thank you. Um, so, we've to to lay out the approach that we've undertaken here. Um, we've we've mapped it out as four four work packages. The first work package. Um, we've we've looked at literature uh, to understand what kind of historic extreme events there are uh, and what existing uh, modeling frameworks there are to ex understand uh, how, how these extreme events are, are modeled. Um, we've begin to begun to categorize the types of events and understand how they can they can impact, but that is a, a broad challenge that we'll, we'll, we'll go into uh, alpha phase if, if we're successful in that. Uh, and then we've begun the critical net, uh, infrastructure infrastructure risk assessment framework in terms of how do we unpick that and how do we have a value uh, output that can be used by an ESO and FSO in the future to, to measure uh, network resilience. So work package two, and I'll come on to this in a bit more detail in the next slide, but we've, we've gone out and spoken with our, our partners on this project to really understand what's, what's currently uh, business as usual and what existing resilience practices are in place. 
um, and uh, yeah, understand the current current state of the art, as it were. Uh, work package three, which has been a core focus, um, trying to understand what kind of modeling framework could be used uh, to to represent this uh, complex and, and quite regularly chaotic system that that you can hit with a, a variety of different unknown events for unknown durations. Um, but we've tried to unpick that and get a simplified representation of it uh, and, and identify the modular el elements that we can we can further develop within an alpha phase uh, and, and similarly outline the use case who, who's going to be using it and how is it going to be used. And then the final final work package there is the, the cost benefit analysis element of it to understand uh, and justify the, the investment of a tool such as this uh, and, and the value it can uh, add to, to a future future network. And with that, I'll pass on to Luke, who will go into a bit more detail on that. Thanks, David. Um, next slide, please. So here's uh, some of the partners we've worked with so far to show you some of the electricity network operators and so on, and uh, Met Office and gas operators and distribution people as well. Next slide. So I'll walk you through the steps we need to develop a risk assessment framework for critical infrastructure. And there's five major steps here, and we've made progress on some of these already. So the first is defining critical infrastructure risk. The second is looking at these extreme events, and identifying where we can get data from. Then the next step is to create scenarios based on this previous information that we have, and also looking at the future too. Then we have started to define the framework for a model and how we could potentially model the risk to the Great British Energy Network. And then finally, we want to be able to quantify the impacts on the system itself. So I'll take you through each of these and the progress we've made so far on them. Uh, next slide. So what is risk, really? So if you're looking at risk in a, as a general concept, it's you'll find the UK government and other organizations tend to look at the impact and the likelihood of things happening and sort of multiply these two together to get the risk. So for, for critical infrastructure, it's the same thing where we have the likelihood and the impact. And what makes it a little bit different is we're gonna be looking at this uh, over a particular region. So for, at the system level it's Great Britain. And also looking at a particular time period too. So it matters whether it's in the next week, in the next month, and further afield than that, so that we can predict what might happen to the network and how we can implement mitigations for that. Because really what we're trying to say here is that we're trying to reduce the risk to the network so that we increase the resilience of it. Next slide. So to do that, we need to firstly identify what kinds of events can impact the system. So this is taken from the UK National Risk Register, and we've just color coded it based on where we think there might be impacts to the system. And some of them, I mean, there's a lot there, so I don't want you to read them all, but for example, why would something like animal diseases, which is in the fourth column at the bottom, um, why would that impact the system? Well, one example is when there was um, foot and mouth disease, there was a couple of years where uh, you were restricted access to certain areas. And so if you restricted access, you can't necessarily maintain and repair things that go down. So that's just one example of how something seemingly unrelated can actually impact our energy system. And also having all of this mapped out here, also allows us to identify what kinds of information we want to model or input into a model and where this information comes from, who provides that information and just map that out. So we've started to do that within this project as well. Next slide, please. And all of that is useful to sort of put together a register of past data. So these past events had certain impacts on our critical infrastructure. And they those happened with a given frequency. So if you take in weather, for example, you know, we know that the weather is changing and therefore this frequency or this probability might change or increase, whatever that might be. So all these things together, um, what's important is the impact it has on the infrastructure. It's not just that it's an event, 
So, uh, and it's not just that it's one particular event because it, like I said, it's multiple things coming together to create what is, is a scenario. So a scenario is a specific situation that's used to analyze and understand the behavior and performance of the system. So we want to form meaningful scenarios that can describe the system and can be tested for the future um, so we can inform our risk model as well. Next slide, please. So this, believe it or not, is a simplified sort of risk model. And so the stuff on the left is still the same. So you got the past information feeding into scenarios. But then we're also looking at the present. So what's currently happening at, on the network? Uh, what data do we have for that? And in the future, you have certain events that might happen and they'll have impacts on the future state of the critical infrastructure. And we have forecasts or projections, depending on your time scales, for what might happen to the system. And the system itself is modeled in the black area there, intentionally vague currently. Um, and that can be done at whatever level of granularity is required. And there are models out there that do this to sort of balance the network and things like that anyway. So we've got these past uh, events that inform our scenarios and we can stress test that with the current information we have about the state of the network now and also what we expect it to be in the future. So the model will then process that and give us a estimation of the risk of something bad happening to the system. So the risk of certain impacts happening to the future critical infrastructure. Next slide, please. And we also want to quantify the impacts. So what are these future impacts gonna be? So aligning with some reports I've been produced uh, by government and other organizations, uh, one, one recommendation is in the future resilience of the UK energy system report to agree these measures of resilience by 2025. So to align with that, we want to do that too. And we, we've been working with stakeholders already. There may be a broader set of stakeholders that are required to map out these resilience measures. Um, if you click, I've realized there's a couple of animations here, so just click twice. Thanks. So what we want to do is, so if you're looking at column three here, medium, as we said earlier, this risk is defined over a particular area, which could be Great Britain and also could be done for something like the Highlands. Um, depends on your context. So this, you could make these tables for different layers if you like. Um, so here we have an example saying that the transmission losses are costing over a million per whatever that time period is. So that could be a day or a month or whatever it is. And that's classified as, as medium impact to the system. These things need to be agreed. This is just an illustration. And once we've, and these can be across all of these different kinds of events. And it's, it's about what the impact is to the system. So if we understand what measures we are putting in place, then we can actually score things properly and then have the appropriate responses and plan for the future too. So here we, we are simplifying things, but we're not trying to make it too simplistic at the same time. Next slide, please. So what progress have we made so far? So you can see that we've defined what critical infrastructure is, risk is. We've categorized some events and we've started to map out the data sources as well. We need to create scenarios and that's something for the next phase. And we've started to define the model. We've only really scratched the surface here because there isn't really enough time and it is quite complicated as well, or complex, I should say. Uh, and we've also proposed a framework for sort of measuring the impacts to the system through resilience measures as well. So all of these things need to be continued really into the next phase. Next slide, please. And over to Dave. Thanks, Luke. So I'm, I'm kind of conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly, quickly rattle through this slide and allow you to read a bit effectively. What does this mean for our alpha phase? Uh, we're going to further develop a conceptual model, uh, as Luke's mentioned there. Uh, there are some complexities there that we need to uh, need to construct and, and define the relationships. Uh, to do that, we're going to look at these um, system classes and effectively have the building blocks of how we can represent 
um, represent the GB energy system and show their dependencies and the level of fidelity that we actually go to that is 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 kind of being debated within the project team at, at the moment. Uh, again, that 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 fine line between simplistic and and simplified. Um, we're, to do that, we're going to work with some of the networks uh, and asset subject matter experts to understand how they could fail and what that cascade failure may look like. Uh, and uh, then we're going to also lean into any existing models that may actually be complementary that we can use and, and uh, build on the outputs and, and, and effectively inputs as well to um, the, the second last slide, I think, is a really interesting one, which is embellishing the uh, the the scenarios and and uh, creating a library of these archetypal events and that becomes really valuable if we hit a storm on a 2023 representation of the the GB energy system and a future energy system with different generation different demand how does how does a future energy system uh, stand up to a similar extreme event um, and does does uh, resilience is, is resilience sustained or, or or does it does it drop away, uh, which is a really useful measure of how we see this tool being used, which comes on to the final point, which is how how is this how is this model going to be used? How is it going to be embedded? Who has access to it? Um, the the ultimate operation of the model and the process in, in which by it will be will be used. So that that I think takes us up to time as well. I would thank you for your your, your attention, uh, and I guess it's handing over to back back to David. I guess for for chairing questions. Yeah, that's right. We've got a a few minutes for Q and A now, about five minutes. So please do start to pop in questions into the box. Um, if I start with one, just around how do you model? a event if it's so low frequency that there might not be any previous data on it what sort of assumptions do you have to use to evaluate that kind of one who wants to take this i'll happily <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the in, at the start it became quite apparent that the the events um as i mentioned in the sort of diagram at the top modeling events with low frequency it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and your focus needs to become less on the event itself, but more on the impact. So understand it's kind of, if you think of a central node of the impact, and then there's a branch out to the to the right, uh, I guess, in terms of what that impact could result in, in terms of the severity of that impact as a cascade failure. And then there's also a branch tree out to the left-hand side from that impact, or what could have caused that. Uh, so, you know, the 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 failure of a, a, a an asset it can be caused by multiple different events that have multiple different frequencies. So, having these archetypal scenarios is how we 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 envisage getting around that, knowing that these uh, combination of various different events can lead to an ultimate impact, and then evaluate the impact on that network, and then using these scenarios to build up. And um, yeah. That that is a, a a bit of a challenge within uh, Alpha as to where we can do a probabilistic modeling approach, uh, and and where it's just better to have a sort of simplistic, more of a a kind of a, a thought piece, um, looking at scenarios to to understand what may happen. And so, might you find that two very different events actually end up having quite similar impacts on the system? So then you can start treating them as kind of a single response. Precisely. Precisely, there is slightly, you know, there may be some surrounding sort of secondary impacts. For, for example, you know, with uh, some of the storms, storm, storm Arwen, for example, and you know, trees felling on the road, limiting access to substations, that impedes restoration time because you can't get access to a certain area, um, and that's the sort of nuances that we kind of want to represent within within the model ultimately. Um, yeah, great. Um, we've got a few questions coming in now. So one of them is, what additional capabilities do you foresee this solution offering on top of any existing weather or data analysis and demand forecasting currently undertaken? I can start for a little bit on that one. Um, well, as we mentioned with the categorization of the events, it's, I think, the Met Office and other people who analyze weather understand weather quite well so we're not going to pretend that we're going to add lots to that 
but what, what's the different about the whole system approach is looking at different types of events that contribute together and also then treating the system initially a, a sort of by box level not going into too much detail and breaking it down where we need to um so it, it is looking at it from a higher level and how we combine those things together which we've not seen done elsewhere got it thanks a lot luke um we've got a question come in from duncan bain who's um, asking what can we learn about the modeling of black slash gray swan events from financial services i can't remember if that was one of your boxes in your earlier slide is it, it that is in our literature report actually i'll just try and um i'll pull it almost rather than make it up <laughs> so we have we have a uh, lloyd's register with uh, within a uh, the the partnership group who have been been feeding into this um and, and the impacts and as luke says we've we've, we've got that within the, the literature review i don't know if you have that up as well there luke But maybe uh, once yeah. whilst you're finding that, Luke, I can move on to another one and we'll come back to it. Mm -hmm. um, so Rob Alden has asked, are there any existing system-wide models of the electricity system? And do you have any pointers for where these might be documented, presumably if other people want to access them as well? Yeah, do you want me to take that? Um, so basically, I think, you know, the place I would start would probably be the 10-year statement published by the electricity system operator. So if you put... Um, 10 year statement ESO um, into Google, it'll take you through to the relevant um, 10 year statement. And in the back of there, there is quite a lot of um, modeling data, uh, the models that are used for that. I think the, if you're interested, I think the GIA, um, sorry, the gas system operators do the same as well for the gas system. Um, so that would be my starting point if people were interested in looking sort of modeling and network data or sort of networks and modeling information. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, John. Um, we've probably got time for one or two more should i come back to you luke on the financial services uh, question first i can go now on that one go for it we've not had uh, input from experts on on this other than our own team just looking at the, the literature out there so that's just a bit of a caveat but there's been there's a couple of things we did look at one was a study of the effect of black swan events on stock markets and developing a mode for predicting and responding to them australian accounting business finance journal um so they're looking at stocks and shares and things and uh, you know financial crashes and all that stuff um so they were looking if there's like pre-shock information uh, that could be used to sort of indicate something happening like a black swan sort of um, impacting the network in a large way and they did observe that kind of thing so these sort of perturbations in the network this is also data that is uh, monitored currently by eso and stuff like that and published as well on, on onto the internet uh, too. So the, I'm sure they do uh, work on, on how they present this and mo interpret inputs to that as well. So I think there's there's more we can learn on that. Um, but there is more to read, but I'll get, I think another question is probably better. Burrell, so having a look through, there's a couple of others which have probably been answered during the presentation, I think, um, but just, um... I'm just... There's Go one on, on uh, about other variables in the model, um, just to explain as well that, you know, it talks about stream weather. So obviously stream weather is one set of scenarios that we wish to look at, but that's not, it's not going to be limited to stream weather. As more, as we build different scenarios, the idea is to have a whole suite. That could be things like hostile acts. Um, we're in discussions with this other work, other, I think, SIF projects looking at things like space weather. Um, there are other acts as well. You know, the um, loot showed a whole range of different risks that we want to look at. Um, so yeah, obviously extreme weather will be part of it, but it's not limited to extreme weather. The idea is to look at a whole range of different events that will impact and which the energy system should be resilient against, or we'll need to make sure the energy system is resilient against. So yeah, it's not just limited to extreme weather. There'll be other things we bring into this as well. Sorry, I just want to make that clear, David, sorry. Yeah, thanks, John. I just wonder, building on that, um, so if your prioritization exercise is a funny one, I guess, because you want to focus on the most frequent or likely infrequent events, if you see what I mean, <laughs> presumably. When does when do you stop and say, right, well, that's too frequent. We kind of understand that reasonably well already. 
and I think that's one of the parts you know, interesting, you know, one of the criteria things. So one of the questions is what is an extreme event? What is a black swan? What's a gray swan? Um, we're also very aware, as I say, these things, the recurrence rates are likely to change. You know, there's, I think there's already been some updates, things we used to, um, what we designed the systems and some of our flood defenses for, I think 15 years ago when we had some major flooding. Um, even now, I think some of those assumptions are being changed in terms of the reoccurrence rates. So that's one of the, when we talk about looking at the future, we're also talking about actually some of these, what we might define as extreme events now, black swan events, may actually be more gray swan events in the future. And therefore the system needs to be, that might justify further investment, further changes. Um, is that okay, David? Does that answer your question? So I think these things need to be, one of the key parts of this project is actually cry, um, doing the criteria of what is extreme event, what events should be looked at. Great, that's really helpful. We will have to move on because of time now, but there are a few questions left in the Q&A. Maybe if the team could take a look and type some responses to them. Uh, but thank you very much. That was really interesting. And to gather from that that you are intending to apply to Alpha. So we look forward to seeing what the plans are for the next phase. Thank you very much, everyone. So now if we could move on to the next slides, Chloe, thank you. Um, we've now got Alice Cheatham and Tom Velli from LCP Delta, who've been partnered with Northern Power Grid on resilient customer response. And we'll have Chris from Northern Power Grid as well. So. Over to you all. Thanks, David. Um, we have the next slide, please. So our Northern Power Grid project um, is uh, focusing on how behind the meter assets can support the most vulnerable uh, customers in extreme weather conditions and uh, even the lighter outages that happen uh, across the UK. Um, if we go through to the, to the next slide, please, David. Uh, uh, we'll have Chris very briefly, um, and then I'll go through the project rationale, the solution and the, out, uh, the outputs and then we'll start to go into the alpha phase and discuss um, our next steps and what we plan to do to, to take this solution, uh, an important solution to the next level of a, a physical trial and a rollout. Next slide, please, David. So um, the project team, it was formed of Norman Power Grid, LCP Delta and the University of Southampton. And just sort of to, to focus the minds again, you'll see there's, there's three uh, sections here of work and, and, and project partner. Um, and resilient customer support, uh, response explores the potential of how behind the meter assets can support the DNA um, and support the most vulnerable. Um, and I think it's important at this stage just to highlight one of Ofgem's most recent reports uh, and, and pushing networks to to go down a, a non-wire approach if possible um, and where possible. So this project sits beautifully in that. Um, the project was seven work packages um, and that was broken down. We've got the typical um, dissemination and your project management. But the key ones I just want to focus on now um, from this slide here is the the behind the meter research that was conducted by LCP. Um, so we looked at all behind the meter assets that are available to date and their technical capabilities, the business models they're offering, the controllability of those assets to identify what, what can be used uh, in this method. Uh, we used and worked with the University of Southampton and um, they were looking at consumer incentives, frameworks and socio-technical technical services um, and how they could be deployed using this method. Um, LCP, we started to take those two sort of key learnings and key outputs to, to develop a solution. So that was the technical side of things, the uh, network configuration, uh, as well as the business models. And then finally, we conducted some network modeling to assess the impact 
um, of the RCR, the Resilient Customer Response Solution. Um, and I know Chris is on the call, but I'll speak on his behalf. Um, so um, obviously Northern Power Grid had a, a huge role in this as well. Um, a couple of things that really sort of stood out, one of which was identifying and, and identifying other projects, um, both within Northern Power Grid that are relatable, as well as other network projects, um, and bringing the key learnings and leveraging the learnings from this to inform other projects. Um, on top of that, uh, and it's something that we should note, is that um, this project was um, highlighted by Ofgem and, and SIF that there was potentially some sort of overlap with National Grid's EV response project. Um, we've had some collaborations. Um, they are very different projects, but there are also some key learnings from both that we feel can inform one another. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I just want to sort of set the scene, please, David. So why this project? We all know that electrification is going to be key in decarbonisation. Um, there's going to be a, a, a greater reliance on it. Uh, and, and ultimately, the, the DNO is going to be managing uh, greater loads um, yeah, going into to 2030, 2040 and 2050 to, met, to meet net zero. So and this includes consumers, businesses and the economy. Um, we're all heavily relying on it. So it's all industries uh, and customers, um, heat power transport, as well as new applications. Uh, working from home is obviously becoming a, 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 an important factor in, in demand management. Um, so we're becoming more dependent. Um, and with that, we're becoming more vulnerable. And then there is the current vulnerable um, who are going to become more vulnerable. Um, if we can go to the next slide, please. David. Um, and then on top of that, you've got these extreme weathers that are taking place. Obviously, we have Storm Arwen um, that really impacted Northern Power Grid. It was widespread disruption. Um, we're seeing that also over in Canada and the US at the moment. Um, and there was a, uh, a, a report and an investigation done by um, by Desnes, um, and, and there were a couple of sort of key elements that this project is looking to address, one of which is um, the length of time uh, customers were without electricity, and it was beyond, uh, beyond the, the sort of tolerable levels. And the other one was the priority service register, which we've seen from this project is extremely important to uh, reevaluate and 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 look at how priority services are, I suppose, categorised, uh, measured, um, and 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 so we're we're sort of following up on on that um, throughout this project. So if I go to the next slide, please, David. Thank you, um, and and the. The resilient customer response approach. Um, so what we wanted to do is look at customers like this image here on the right hand side uh, with, with battery and PV offering uh, and other behind the meter assets and see if they can support the most vulnerable, which, which sounds straightforward in terms of let's, you know, if you've got a battery, can you support your uh, um, your, your nearest neighbour who might be vulnerable. Um, but obviously there are market mechanisms that need to take place. There's technical network configurations that need to take place and there's business models behind that. Um, and on top of all of that, uh, the work the University of Southampton um, identified was, well, what's the interplay? What, what are people with, I suppose, prosumers, if you like? So ones with behind the meter assets, quite rich with behind the meter assets, what they what can they do and what are they prepared to do to support the vulnerable? Um, so there was a, you know, a large literature review done by Southampton, um, 
looking at the incentivization uh, for, for customers who, who require it and, and who could offer it, um, as well as um, the cost benefit different approaches that we took, uh, taking into account the value of lost load, incentive structures and network cost benefits. Again, we, we're trying to not only empower prosumers, but we're also trying to follow off GEMS um, approach of, of, of using assets that are available to us rather than reinforcing the network. Um, can we have the next slide, please, David? Thanks. So the project innovation, so the technical concept is building off other projects, micro resilience and resilience as a service, uh, which are more B2B offerings. This is very much B2B to C, um, looking at how customers can, can support fellow customers. However, there would be some interaction between obviously the network, as well as a possible supplier. Um, we're looking at how to optimize those investments and uh, exploiting behind the meter assets. Uh, and what we have identified under this project is how batteries are, are the, the, the key solution um, and can significantly reduce um, greater levels of battery storage. So if you're if you take the proposed solution here where we're which requires islanding almost a microgrid approach um, we don't require i suppose the the resilience as a service solution which is a project done from um with another network operator um but it still requires a battery but it's significantly less so what we're doing is actually leveraging what the assets customers have to prevent those bigger investments bigger batteries going forward um, what this does, it allows prosumers to invest in their own reliance um, and support vulnerable, which is key um, going into um, yeah, 2030 when we're starting to see greater levels of electrification, both in heat, power and transport. And, and finally, and it, I think this is really important, this is something that's come out from the University of Southampton, uh, is that customers um, are free to choose their desired levels. And I'll go into this in a bit more de in a bit more detail on the next slide. But um, what we're looking as a solution going into into the alpha phase is how um, what's the mechanism to facilitate this going forward? And so we see this as a subscription model. And David, if you go through to the next slide, please. So, uh, yeah, the one after, thank you, yeah. Um, so a subscription model, so where the vulnerable can sub subscribe through their energy supplier and the same for prosumers with behind the meter assets. They subscribe through their energy supplier, they register their assets, their power potential and their availability and what they're prepared to supply and to who. Um, that's the model that we're approaching. And what we've done, we've taken the learnings from EV response, micro resilience, RAS, uh, ENW's VOL. And, um, and one of the things that we have done in this project is, is present this project to Ofgem through one of their lunchtime sessions. They have lunchtime seminar sessions. Now, although Ofgem, as some of us will be aware, are reluctant to give uh, feedback there were some really important questions that came off the back of that presentation, which has helped us shape the alpha project and what we want to achieve um, going into that project. Um, so just a few other things to sort of highlight at this stage, uh, I think it's really important, um, is the high percentage of vulnerable customers. Um, and we've seen this with an average of almost 30% of the UK, which is, um, yeah, colossal really and and we uh, we only see that number going up as we further electrify um with smart homes and heat power and transport assets um 
And within that research piece, um, which was conducted by LCP and University of Southampton, one thing that really sort of stood out was communication and how that is the most important aspect and preserving that communication service. Um, one of the work packages that LCP was involved in and, and led on was uh, research into what assets are available and what their technical capability. And there's a couple of things to highlight here is, yeah, battery solutions, battery storage is, is highlighted as the, the key enabler here. But at the same time, not all battery storage is um, domestic battery storage is applicable. Not all battery storage can remain online in an outage. So I think that's important to be aware of. There are a handful um, of domestic battery storage units that remain online and can facilitate um, support for the vulnerable, but it is limited at the moment. However, we do expect that to increase going into 2030. I think some of you are probably asking, well, why, why not have you looked at EVs uh, and V2G? Because obviously larger batteries, et cetera. We've touched on it, but we've deliberately avoided that for this project um, because of the EV response project, which is National Grid's distribution's um, uh, focus on. So what we've said is that and what we've agreed as part of our obligations is to um, provide and share learnings. Can we have the next slide, please, David? Just a couple of minutes warning on the presentation, Tom. Yeah, that, that's fine. So I'll just quickly fly through this one. Um, so one of the aspects is modeling work that we've done. Uh, and on the right, you can see um, the modeling method. And just a few things to highlight here. Um, we think based on our, our method, our solution, um, and um, based on uptake scenarios and network capacity, uh, and that's flown through into our network model and our BTM models, uh, that you can, um, yeah, we can support 10% of the most vulnerable by 2025. Uh, and that could be for an hour if there were no load restrictions or somewhere between three to five hours if, if uh, we're, we're sort of limited that restriction to 250 watts. Um, although in 2025, it's not likely that we can do all of that. Uh, by 2030, we can see that a huge number of prosumers can support the vulnerable. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, 2040 and 2050, uh, we expect no restrictions at all. Uh, and finally, next slide, please, David. Thanks, so next steps. Uh, we very much are planning on taking this to the next stage with Alpha. We want to, or now that we've proven that the model can work and there's technical, it's technically viable from a both BTM and network perspective, we're aware of business models. We've established some business models. We want to take this to the next level, um, taking LV configurations um, and, and model that on Northern Power Grid's network. We want to really um, design some um, business models specifically to this. We're going to do some technical trials at the PNDC up at Strathclyde. Uh, and then finally, just a few others. Um, we, we're very keen to sort of touch base with the affected of Storm Arwen two years on. Um, and then we'll go into a greater cost benefit analysis off the back of that and a, and a field trial design looking at going into beta phase of the project. Brilliant, thank you very much. We've got um, a couple of minutes, but we are running behind, so we'll try and get through some of these question, questions quite quickly, but thanks a lot for the presentation, Tom. Um, one that we've got is, if you're using microgrids to support control between customers, does this mean that the solution will only be able to be deployed to vulnerable consumers who are connected to a private wire or IDNO network? Um, I'm happy to take that unless Chris our, or Alice is, or Chris is there. If you, he's a... Yeah, you take it, Tom. 
Yeah, uh, no, the answer to that is, uh, no, it doesn't have to be a private wire network. And um, we would, yeah, I think that's the next level for us in terms of the project at this stage, at this early stage, it was just understanding the technical feasibility of it and what the proposed method could be. I think going into uh, the alpha phase, that's something we would explore. But based on what we're with our current learnings is that, no, it wouldn't just be a private wire. Got it. Um, will you be publishing any of your data and a white paper of your approach in alignment with Ofgem's data triage in and open data requirements? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've got a, a detailed modeling method um, as well as uh, so highlighting our approach and our um, yeah the references to the data that we've used um, throughout that. So we will share that as well as Southampton's literature review as well. Um, as an individual output. And just where's the best place point. for people to find that smart oh, network? So just, uh, just worth pointing out, though, that the, uh, there's no new data from this. This is all just standard published uh, network data that's, uh, that's generally available. It's uh, very much based on the regulatory information that is published always anyway. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Chris. Um, we've got another question from Rob saying, presumably this is totally dependent on the smart meter rollout completing. Maybe it can't work on a single Alvi spur if any one customer does not have a smart meter. Would non-vulnerable customers be switched out and not get service in an outage? So two different questions there, I think. Does it require all customers to have a smart meter within the area? And then the second one on um, non-vulnerable customers being switched out and at, at risk of not getting service. Um, Alice, Chris, any? No, well, I, I don't think it does. And I think some of the approaches that we are already looking at uh, outside of this project in the community DSO project, for instance, uh, where very much uh, equity of opportunity involvement uh, is quite high up in our, uh, our thinking, but would make sure that we would uh, try and uh, avoid that. Um, everybody having a smart meter is certainly uh, 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 one of the facilitators that makes our life easier with respect to these types of things, uh, but that is certainly not the, uh, the path that we uh, were intending to go down. So. We're, Certainly, uh, in the, uh, the alpha phase and beyond, we'll be looking at uh, just understanding the implications of that and whether you could use uh, perhaps relatively sparse data from uh, smart meters to uh, make some inference about uh, what else is going on in uh, certain parts of the network that we want to use for this sort of approach. Uh, that said, we don't know quite yet, but certainly uh, our intent is not to uh, uh, just try and uh, uh, pick on people who uh, 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 we can exclude from this. It's to very much be as inclusive as uh, technically and humanly possible. Could it be the case that um, people who want to participate would be offered the opportunity via their supplier to get a smart meter installed anyway? Uh, yeah, and I think every uh, supplier is trying to get everybody on smart meters anyway, if the uh, number of uh, emails I get from my supplier uh, is anything to go by. So uh, I think that's a problem that will solve itself over uh, the next few years. You've got to get your smart meter installed then, Chris. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> great. OK, we'll, we'll have to move on now for time. Um, but thank you very much. There's great presentation again. Um, we do have a break coming up after the last um, presentation in this block. But if we move on to UK Power Networks, who will be presenting on their WARN project. So with no further ado, over to Maria, Alexander and James. Yeah, hi. Um, I think we're going to have just a, uh, so I'm Andrew Groom. I'm from the Institute for Environmental Analytics. We've been leading this project from the technical perspective, but our uh, Licensee and lead partner is UK Power Networks, and I think we're just going to have a quick introduction from James before I launch into the proposal or into the uh, presentation. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. It's just the two of us um, that are presenting. Um, so yeah, um, as Andrew said, I'm James Daniel. I'm Innovation Project Manager at UK Power Networks. 
And this is show and tell of the project WARN, which stands for um, a bit of a mouthful, weather alerts and risk analysis for network operators. So UK Power Networks together with the Institute of Envir Environmental Analytics are tackling the growing concern of extreme weather and the impact on, on energy network operators. So over the past two months, we've conducted a material amount of user research actually uh, with UK Power Networks operational and strategic teams to help identify what the, the right problems are for us to solve and focus on. And then we've narrowed down on finding the right solutions to solve those problems. And the, what I'm really pleased with is actually the stakeholder engagement has been phenomenal and they've, they've seen the value in this project and are very supportive uh, and interested to see how this develops. Um, so I'm excited to actually um, see here Andrew's um, um, explanation of the project that we've just gone through um, and bring it to life for all of you. So yeah, over to you, Andrew. Thanks, James. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So yeah, next slide, that's just the interest slide. So just to recap on, on the problem space here, so I'm aligned a little bit to what others have already been talking about, but I think it's, um, it's clear for all that extreme weather, or even in our case, unusual weather, can contribute to increased risk or even deterioration in asset health. For, for the infrastructure which makes up the, uh, the distribution networks. All of this is being exacerbated by climate change, which is driving increasing uncertainty really in terms of how these risks will evolve into the future. And so the DNO is the distribution network operators who own and operate these infrastructures. They are under pressure to find ways to improve their understanding of these risks, to improve the ways in which they can respond and manage things effectively in the current operations and also to find ways to mitigate future risks and to future-proof their networks and increase the overall resilience of the networks. Next slide, please. So the solution that we've been developing and looking at through the discovery phase is what ultimately will be a new software application, but it includes a couple of other components in terms of the overall solution. But it's really about trying to help with improving understanding of the, the risks which are posed by weather and climate, um, and then enabling more monitoring and response capabilities to, to mitigate those risks and respond to them. So the key building blocks here, the first piece is, is around data analysis. So this is historical analysis, deep dive, statistical analysis to look for patterns between past weather events and operational issues. This is faults, but also asset health. Um, having established those vulnerability profiles, that will then enable us to start characterizing vulnerability on a network-wide basis. And this is to try and inform improved operational planning and also strategic decision making. So there are some strategic investments which would benefit from having this improved understanding. Um, but we'll also then be able to monitor for those conditions which contribute to risk and in this way start to improve response mechanisms within the networks. And we'll also be able to start analyzing how these vulnerabilities may evolve into the future by looking at these in the context of climate projections. And this is, of course, then to help with strategic planning, um, improving overall network resilience. Next slide, please. So um, our approach to the discovery phase, we've had two months. Um, the objectives here, of course, have been to really explore the problem space, to improve our understanding of where the challenge areas are, to, to come up with some initial design concepts, to validate all of that thinking, um, and to understand really where we can add operational value in the context of this concept. So we've gone through this four-step approach um, to, to, to go through the discovery phase. The first stage was, was stakeholder engagement. We had a round of online meetings with quite a large number of business leaders and subject matter experts from across a number of different parts of UK power networks. Emergency planning was one of those. Three different departments from within the overall asset management directorate. Uh, so this is asset strategy, quality of supply and network planning. And also some other business functions which are important for the overall solution. So we need data to enable the solution, it's data-driven. We've had discussions with the enterprise data management folk that manage all of the data within UK Power Networks. And we also need to think about how this can best be integrated into the existing landscape of systems within UK Power Networks. And so we've spoken to the information systems architecture people as well. We've then taken a little bit of time through phase two to, um, if you like, review all of those outputs, consolidate our understandings, produce some initial design concepts, and then what we wanted to do is validate all of that thinking and what those initial design concepts look like and the ideas that we've had for how we can add value operationally. And so the third step has been a subsequent round of um, 
engagement with those business leaders and subject matter experts to play back our thinking and get their thoughts on how that's all looking and the relevance of those things and the validity of those things. And then as a fourth step, we've just refined our, our thinking based on the feedback from the stakeholder playback sessions, put together all the deliverables for the project and started our preparations for transitioning to the alpha phase. The next slide, please. So the first main outcome from the discovery phase, of course, is understanding the, uh, the problem space. Where are the challenges today? How do things work today? Uh, and how can we then best strive to try and address those? So across those four business areas that we've been engaging with, emergency planning, they are the people who are responsible for preparing the business to respond to emergencies and then managing the, the response when emergencies happen. So a key thing for them to worry about is what volume of faults are they likely to experience from a particular forecasted weather event? They also then need to think about what level of escalation within the business is appropriate to put in place sufficient resources to respond to these events whilst maintaining a particular service level. But of course, they also want to avoid incurring unnecessary costs in doing so. They also worry about the future. They have very well established mature capabilities to respond to emergencies today. But if storm events and other extreme weather events are going to change into the future, the implication is that those response protocols will need to change as well, and they need to understand that. The quality of supply people are looking at uh, customer interruptions and customer minutes lost. These are two key metrics that are tracked by the business and are re re reported on to Ofgem. And of course, the objective here is to minimize those as much as possible. They are also responsible for managing the overall vegetation containment program. This is a large cost driver during the year. There are a significant number of faults caused by vegetation. And so that's a big area of effort that can be um, a focus for improvement as well. And then there's this concept of worst served customers. So this is a category across all the distribution network operators. Those customers that experience a certain number of faults, either in a year or over a number of years, and should therefore be provided with, um, or should therefore, therefore be prioritized when, when looking for solutions. And where UK power networks are concerned, they're looking here both at permanent faults, but also a new category of transient faults, which has become more problematic and, and occurrences of those have been increasing. So they're starting to look at those as well. Asset strategy. Um, these are the people who are responsible for maintaining overall asset health. So UK power networks has a large network across three different regions. There's hundreds of thousands of assets in play. And one of the main objectives there is to plan a cost-effective program of physical inspections of these assets. So hundreds of thousands of assets being completed, of, of inspections being completed each year, we need a plan for that. They need to report on overall asset health. This is again something which goes to Ofgem, um, and of course interested in, in being able to do that as efficiently as possible. They also then need to think about when things should be replaced. There's a number of factors which could take into consideration for that um, and coming up with an optimized plan for when those are replaced is another key focus area for asset strategy. Network planning, these are the people who are planning the, the networks of the future. So they cut across all of these problems, they try to understand them and think about how they could mitigate those in the future and come up with a plan for increasing resilience whilst minimizing spend. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary slide, a subset of the things which we've identified in terms of opportunities to add value. There's a much longer list. This is just to give a flavor. But across the top, um, across all four of these parts of the business, they are interested in understanding better the relationships between weather and the operational issues that they are worried about. So in emergency planning, we're highlighting here relationships between weather and faults. Key weather variables here are wind, rainfall, lightning, and temperature. Within quality of supply, something new coming out of the project is this, 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 this idea to start looking at multi-hazards. So not looking at weather variables in isolation, which has typically been the case in the past, but thinking about how weather variables may combine to produce risk and also compound effects. That's actually relevant across both emergency planning and, and the quality of supply guys. Asset strategy, they're also interested in the relationships between weather, but, also, but here we're talking about relationships with asset health rather than faults. Network planning, again, cutting across, interested in all asset level vulnerabilities. So this cuts across faults and asset health in order to plan for the future. And a couple of examples here of business area specific opportunities to add value. So on the emergency planning side, they are already consuming weather forecasts, but they're interested in anything there which in enables them to get increased insight from those weather forecasts. So we've got some ideas about how we can help them with that. And of course, that then feeds through into a better conversion potentially in terms of numbers of faults they might need to deal with and how they can plan for that. On the quality of supply side, there are a number of use cases, but one example here is strategic planning. Sectionalizing the network is a, is a 
a big driver for reducing those customer interruptions and customer minutes lost. Um, but they need an optimized plan for doing that to increase the impact of that and, and obviously build the investment case for doing so. Asset strategy, interested in being able to improve the protocols that they follow in order to just manage and, and maintain asset health and plan those inspections. Network planning, as I've said, interested in simulations, analyses, anything that can inform those investment strategies. We've got some cross-cutting ideas there, which will help with that. Across all of these business areas, they are all to some extent or another interested in vulnerabilities of today and how those vulnerabilities may evolve into the future. So the analysis on climate change impacts is relevant across the piece. Next slide, please. So we haven't done a full cost benefit analysis. That's something which is planned for the alpha phase, but we have got quite a few insights in terms of the sorts of metrics that are available, the sorts of metrics that we would use to establish a baseline and also some initial targets against which we can benchmark the impacts of WARN. Just some examples here, the numbers are commercially sensitive. So these are just some examples to just give a flavor of the sorts of things we'll be using. So on the emergency planning side, known costs associated with specific fault types. So we can start to compare against those sorts of numbers. On the asset strategy side, there are known costs for asset replacements, particularly in the context of whether something is planned or unplanned and the cost, there are cost implications if that changes. Two examples on the quality of supply side, for the strategic upgrades on the substation switching, there are known volumes associated with doing this and known costs associated with doing that as well. Substantial amounts of investment required for that work running into tens of millions. Um, this is why there's interest in optimized planning for that. And on the vegetation side as well, of course, known costs for the program itself. Um, and also we understand the, the, the operational objectives, for what they would be trying to achieve where vegetation containment is concerned. So we're taking that through into the uh, cost benefit analysis in the alpha phase if we're successful. Next slide, please. So this is just a summary to show you how the, uh, the concept has evolved from where we started out before the discovery phase to where we are now, the transition from discovery phase into the alpha phase. Summary on the left is where we started. So this concept of a, of a digital solution to help understand these issues and, and mitigate and plan for improved responses. The data analysis piece to build these vulnerability profiles by looking at historical weather data in the context of historical operations data. Monitoring and alerting across three time horizons. Uh, this is, we believe, unique to, to warn. So looking at the short term, the seven day ahead, characterizing the season ahead, and also looking at that climate change perspective. The concept of using machine learning to enable continuous improvement as the monitoring proceeds, um, but the initial focus really was just on emergency planning and quality of supply. So the core concept has remained. We've validated that through discovery phase, but there are some refinements and there are some extensions to what it is we are planning to do for alpha phase. So the core concept remains the same. We will still be doing the deep dive data analysis on historical data to develop those vulnerability profiles. But crucially here, we will now be working at the level of the individual asset. So this is moving beyond the typical kind of aggregations that have been used in the past in terms of characterizing numbers of faults and, 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 and vulnerabilities. Also, as I've mentioned before, we will be moving away from just looking at individual key weather variables in isolation, which has typically been the focus of innovation in the past and other initiatives. And we'll be starting to look at how those weather variables may combine to produce risk. We'll still be doing the automated monitoring. We're still maintaining those three timeframes. We'll still be looking at machine learning to enable the software to continue to improve, but we are expanding our focus to cover those four beneficiary business areas. So there are a longer list of uh, use cases and there's more, more interest across a wider number of business areas. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the plan for alpha phase, uh, this is just a high level schedule to give you an idea of how things will fit together. So activities have already started and will continue even in the lead up to the, to the alpha phase. If we're successful, looking at things like confidentiality agreements, getting those sorts of things in place. That would enable us to start on day one with two work streams, data access and analysis, and also the system design proof of concept activities. Both of those things will run through the full six months. They can proceed in parallel to a large extent. Um, and we will also be working with an additional, addition, an additional licensee in the alpha phase if we get there, which is with SSEN. So we'll be trying to maximize the data mining opportunity as we move through that six month phase. The first usable outcomes will feed into the um, system design work, which can proceed with initial consolidation of design ideas and things to begin with in parallel, moving through into a testing and refinement phase. We'll be looking to get feedback as much as possible, uh, bring that into what it is we do and refine the ideas and demonstrate as much practical potential as we can. Um, and largely in parallel with all those activities, some more commercially focused activities. So cost benefit analysis and the plan for transitioning to beta 
and then project management, just keeping everything in line with, with project budgets and schedules. Last slide, please. Uh, next slide. So we're now starting from square one on this. Uh, we've got a couple of examples. This is Weather Asset. This is a global weather analytics service. We've already developed this from idea through to something which is offered commercially. This is focused in the agricultural space, but it's a very similar concept, monitoring weather related risks for any crop in any global growing location. So we can already do some of these things. We've got some software building blocks and some functional capabilities, which we can transfer and take advantage of for, for one. Next slide, please. And we've also done some related proof of concept work. This was done in Colombia, a very similar concept. So looking at weather related risks, um, in this case, for the transmission system operations and the equivalent of a distribution network operator. This was just a proof of concept. It's not operational, but again, it's given us some ideas and it's given us some opportunities to confront the sorts of technical development challenges we'll, we'll face. Um, and we'll be using some of that experience as well to inform what we do in alpha phase. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks very much. I think that's uh, the time. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, we've got time for a couple of questions, which are actually really about the link up between other projects. So hopefully there is some benefit in the way that we've been grouping these show and tells this morning. The first one is asking, are you interested in any of the Black Swan events that the Scenarios for Extreme Events project was looking at? Is there an opportunity from linking up both your models to better manage faults on the DNO level too? Yeah, I think uh, we're very much focused on, on weather. So we're not interested in the, the more geo geopolitical events or pandemics or some of the other things which the earlier project was talking about. That's looking much broader. We're also focused in the, at the moment on the distribution network infrastructure rather than other types of infrastructures at the moment. But of course, we would be interested in terms of how weather related risk emerges from, from that project. We did talk to them um, during the discovery phase. So we've had a, an opportunity to share what it is we're doing, what it is they're doing, and we're comfortable that they're, the complement, there are complementarities rather than overlaps. Um, but there's of course an opportunity potentially to learn something from what they're doing and, and vice versa, have them learn from what we're doing. That's the case across various other initiatives as well. Um, we've, we've spoken to two other initiatives, one within the, the, the tranche of project that UK Power Networks are involved in, two outside of that. Um, we've been looking to make sure that we're understanding what others are doing, um, but also looking for potential synergies if, if they exist. Brilliant. Um, we've also got a question around vulnerable consumers and will the ana analysis from your model aid the ability to be able to identify vulnerable areas where consumers might be more likely to be affected by extreme events? So is vulnerability a sort of parameter in your analysis? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we were very interested in vulnerability, but we were interested in vulnerability from the perspective of the infrastructure itself, rather than the, the characterization which might be placed on a particular consumer. So consumers, I guess, could be vulnerable from a social perspective or, or from their exposure to the, to the network itself. We, we are interested in the vulnerabilities of the network to the risks which weather and climate pose. Um, so a concept like worst served customers, where there are currently customers that experience over a particular threshold of faults in a given year or over a period of three years, those customers are very much in scope for us because they are the ones that are at the moment experiencing perhaps higher proportions of faults than others, and they get prioritized focus anyway from the distribution network operators. So that's in scope for us, but not so much the social aspects around vulnerability of, of consumers. Got it. And we've got a final question from Duncan Bain again. Um, are you considering additional instrumentation to enable faster reaction to events like localized flooding affecting network assets? So deployment of sensors and other instrumentation on the network, I presume. Uh, yeah, it's a good question, interesting question. Um, no is the is the immediate response. We're not planning on doing any any deployment of in situ instrumentation. We'll be um, consuming existing weather forecasts and existing weather data and climate projections to characterize risk um, and then to forecast for potential issues when they might take place. Uh, but this is almost always worthwhile complementing with other sources of information if they are available. So I think this is a, an interesting point um, and one I think we'll, we'll have a look at in, in the alpha phase if we get the opportunity to do so. I suppose as you start prototyping your model, you'll get a bit more richness around whether you've got gaps in your data which need to be filled to actually make Exactly. I mean, the, the, the data analysis piece is, is very much the first step for us. So that will really help us understand you know, how well can these relationships be established between historical weather data and, and the historical operations data that UK power networks have. Um, how reliable can those relationships be? They need to be stable. They need to be reliable in order to deliver ongoing operational benefits. 
you asked an interesting question earlier, David, around um, characterizing issues when there aren't very large sample sizes. This is one of the things which will also come out of that analysis. So, you know, which types of which types of weather event, which types of weather risk can we characterize well by looking at historical data versus perhaps using other techniques that other projects are looking at? Brilliant. Thank you very much. We'll um, wrap up there then, Andrew, but thank you for the presentation. And as, I'd just like to comment on how encouraging it is to see the third party partners of networks in all of these projects really taking a very strong role in the project and pushing things forward. We'll have a quick 10 minute break now to get started at just after 11.30. We've got a number of, well, we've got four more presentations for the next session, um, ranging UK Power Networks, a lead on three of them, but we'll be starting with Southern Gas Networks Looking Glass project. So see you at half, just gone half past. Okay, Chloe, if we could just skip on to the next slide. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we'll continue with the next part of the show and tell. We continue on the theme of improving system resilience. And these next set of projects are taking a number of different looks, look at things. The first project from SGN will be focused on cybersecurity resilience before we move on to Trinity from UKPN, which is really looking at how can we improve control um, control room systems for DNOs. And then we'll finally be moving on to Credo Plus, which is climate resilience across different utilities projects before finishing up with the final project of this session, which is Comms Connect, which as you might imagine from the name is really looking at the future communications um, on the energy system and how that can better manage resilience. So if I could now hand over to Mo from Delta Flare to talk us through the Looking Glass project. Right, hello everybody. Uh, very good, so um, uh, I guess this project uh, is, is mostly around looking at um, creating um, different means of assessing cybersecurity, um, and it will all become apparent. Um, so can I have the next slide? Um, so I'll run you through um, the, an introduction into um, why we are doing this, uh, and the, uh, the parties that are involved in this project. Uh, we'll have a look at um, the challenge that um, it's not just energy systems, but obviously energy system in, in particular are facing uh, around cybersecurity of operational technology um, and investments, etc. Uh, we'll look at um, the innovation, uh, the, uh, the what we've done in the um, uh, in this phase of the project. Um, we'll be able to sort of define success um, at this stage as well, um, and a uh, brief look at what Alpha will bring. Next slide, please. So uh, the partners in this project, um, Delta Flare, um, we are um, the uh, sort of OT cybersecurity SME for the gas industry in particular. So we are the competent design authority uh, in, within the UK gas. Um, uh, we're, we're a technology company uh, primarily, so you will see the theme in this project has been around uh, use of technology and automation and, um, uh, and, and how that would provide the value uh, to the consumers and to the industry. Um, SGN, uh, who are the network licensee, uh, have been very helpful in providing um, us with their view on how this will support them and help them in securing their infrastructure and an investment uh, thesis. Um, we're obviously looking at this from Delta First perspective, from a comp from a sort of a competent authority in in this um, uh, as well, and how that would translate to off gems role in the future. Um, and the Ministry of Defence, the Cyber Resilience Program, have been supporting us from. Um, 
a different industry's view on what we are going through in the energy sector. And it's very important because what we wanted, one of the key areas of success for us is to end up with something that is uh, consumable by not just off jam and the energy sector and the, the midstream off stream sector. Uh, it was important that we end up with something that is uh, applicable to multiple industries that are governed by the same um, uh, legal frameworks. Um, so next slide, please. Thank you. Right. Um, just to give everybody a background who may not be aware of this, um, uh, in 2018, the UK uh, transposed a directive from the EU uh, from when we were part of the EU, um, and that uh, was the network information um, uh, and network and information systems regulations. These set of regulations are effectively imposing a number of requirements on what is branded as the operators of essential services. Um, it imposes um, a number of requirements, but the key one is that they will have to apply, select and ap apply and maintain appropriate and proportionate cybersecurity controls um, uh, uh, within their critical systems. Now, since 2018, uh, all the operators of essential service, um, so all of the gas and electricity suppliers in the UK would have been part of that. Um, they, they, are, they have been going through quite an intensive exercise of self-assessment against um, a set of guidance provided by the National Cybersecurity Centre um, where they have assessed how uh, they they are they fare against those criteria, but also then putting in place a number of uh, programs to to better and to um, uh, to achieve the the targets that they they have been set by their competent authority. Uh, the gas and electricity sectors competent authority is not, is um, is off jam. Uh, as well as the, uh, the energy regulator. Um, and so they've been in, in contact with them and, they've, and many of them have been going through a number of um, uh, audits and, and, uh, and, and discussions with their competent authority on how uh, their betterment program and where they are within that. Um, so one of the one of the challenges that the industry um, has been facing is how do we assess whether the controls, whether they are technology te technical, whether they are uh, organisational, the, the controls that have been selected are as the legal framework requires them to be appropriate and proportionate, but also have they used um, the right? Ha have they been the best value for money, uh, if you will, for the consumers who are paying for it at the end of the day, and are they providing the right level of security for the risk that those organizations are exposed to? Um, so, and this is this this challenge is is kind of a sort of an ongoing uh, problem in not only the uh, the operational technology, but somewhat in the IT, which is uh, a lot more mature um, compared to the OT cybersecurity. Um, to um, uh, eff effectively, one of the one of the challenges that the uh, the cybersecurity industry faces is that because it's been very difficult to assess whether a control has been uh, providing the right level of secure uh, uh, controls against uh, one or a number of uh, security challenges or risks. Um, there's been a huge amount of investment in um, in in checking whether the controls have failed rather than whether they are still working. So if you will, if you think about security of your home, uh, instead of checking to make sure that the locks are working, you invest most of your money in uh, intrusion uh, detection. So you say, I know I have a lock, but I don't know if it's good enough. So I'm just gonna just make sure that no, if anybody comes in, I'll, I'll um, um, I know about it. And we wanted to change that mindset. So we wanted to say, actually, much like your car, 
where you carry out an MOT and you constantly check it to make sure that it's still doing what it's meant to be doing rather than waiting until it you know, fails in the middle of the motorway and then find out that it's not working. We want to we want to have this continuous check to make sure that the controls are uh, effective and working. So that's one of the challenges. But um, one of the so the the specific challenge from uh, this round of SIF was around um, being able to um, understand the resilience and robustness of energy systems, being able to improve them, but also looking at um, uh, future investment and and using this to inform that as well. Um, so in response to that, we set out in uh, on this on this particular program. Next slide, please. Uh, so we defined ourselves a number of success criteria um, at the beginning of this project. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, the first one was to make sure that we can get a repeatable uh, score for the robustness and resilience of one of these op operators of essential service facilities. Um, so think about uh, a substation or think about a overground, above ground facility. So regardless of the size and the complexity of these facilities, we wanted to be able to, based on the way they operate and based on the controls they have and the risk that they have, to be able to derive this robustness score, create uh, and achieve a robustness score for the operators of a central service uh, as a whole, as a business. Um, one of the things that was important and, and, a, and a huge learning from the uh, functional safety or safety industry was that we wanted to impose a number of criteria upon each of these security controls. And it was that we wanted to ensure or be able to uh, assure that uh, the security controls are effective for the risk that they are treating and uh, that they are auditable. And that um, if you can't audit a control, it's probably not a very good one. Um, uh, the the other one was that we wanted, as as I mentioned earlier, to make sure that uh, this methodology and the technology and the techniques around it are accepted by the NIS uh, competent authorities, uh, not just Ofgem, um, but also we wanted to uh, we we have aspiration to ensure that uh, these uh, these methodologies are adopted internationally for measuring robustness and resilience of um, uh, operators. We wanted to make sure that it's scalable. Uh, as you can imagine, as you know, there are uh, hundreds of facilities that dotted across the UK. So they have challenges around um, connectivity, uh, the geographical spread, uh, and the way they operated, both from a business and, and also on the ground level. So we wanted to make sure that they are scalable, uh, that can be applied to any type of facility and can be automated as well. Um, we wanted to make sure we build on the work that has been done by the operators of essential, essential services because there was no, it was no good for us to come in and say, well, it's great that you've been working for the last five years and responding to their needs, but here's a different way of doing something. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the risk assessment that's done uh, from the OT perspective, but also from an organizational uh, level uh, that can be fed into this rather than uh, uh, start from scratch. And, and effectively, I think it was important and it is important that the least amount of work is done to, to sort of migrate and create this robustness score. Um, and, and robustness score from us was if you will, like your clear score for your financial, personal financial. When you look at it, you know where you stand personally and across the country and, 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 and the simplicity of it is, is key here. Um, but also fairly transparent, you know what goes into it. Um, and we wanted, whilst um, simplicity means uh, transparency in that you know how simple uh, it is and what goes into this calculation mechanism, um, we wanted it to be flexible so that it can be tailored um, uh, by adding more depth and definition to to this uh, criteria, to this um, uh, technique, so that 
uh, say in the defense, if they want to add other layers to it because that's how they operate, that, that is possible as well. Next slide, please. A couple of minutes warning, man. That's fine, thank you. Uh, uh, this is, uh, the rest is uh, downhill from here, uh, easy. Uh, so what we've done is uh, we've, we've looked at uh, the, the, uh, all the work that has been done uh, previously. We didn't want to uh, create the wheel from scratch. Uh, so we've built upon some of the techniques that have been used uh, in the cybersecurity industry in the, in the past. And uh, we've effectively created a, a, a very transparent calculation mechanism now uh, that can be automated. Um, and uh, we, uh, we've, uh, the, uh, the premise is that we feed in the risk assessment that the operators have already carried out uh, into this mechanism um, to reduce the burden on this conversion from risk assessment uh, to our method. We have uh, looked at um, uh, machine learning models like generative languages so that we can look at converting this with ease and so that we don't have to add personal opinion to it as well. Um, and to get to this, to this final uh, score, we've had the litmus test now from, uh, from uh, SGM uh, and uh, also across from a different industry from uh, the MOD to say, yes, this, this methodology is really, really good and we'd like to see this uh, applied and grow. Um, and uh, and how this will help decision making in the future as well. Next slide, please. Um, one of the mechanisms that we've used to look at the effectiveness of controls uh, is to create labs that are represent representative of an operator or an industry. Uh, the one on the right is something that applies to the gas industry. Um, and we've looked at automating this again to make sure that this is continuously tested so that you almost get this uh, real-time view on uh, whether a control is effective and how that affects the, the robustness and the resilience score of the facility. Next slide, please. Um, we, um, so in, in simple terms, uh, we've, we've created a facility where we have these layers of threats and security controls and the controls effectiveness to get to this robustness score that we wanted to get but it can be in the beta phase possibly even uh, in the alpha if, if if we like to add these other layers depending on the industry that we want to add to it as well next slide please um, in the alpha phase specifically we want to explore a bit more around automation of taking the risk assessment in to our calculation engine. Uh, we've, we've done some work on it in, the, um, in this phase, but it's just, um, it, needs, it needs a lot more uh, effort, but the uh, initial uh, outcome have been very successful. Next phase, next slide, please. Um, and uh, just to end on this slide, um, what the way we see this is this uh, real time or near real time, uh, dashboard where from the regulator for before for their assessment of a uh, of an organization or at the board level if you are looking at the value that you're spending on, on a control on how that will affect your uh, monetized risk profile but also your robustness so um, it's it's very easy now to to look at the risk assessment that outputs in monetary terms, what the risk of an organization is against a number of um, uh, initiating causes and an outcome, um, and then almost do this what if analysis of what is the best control that I can or controls that I can put in place to reduce my risk to uh, as low as as possible, um, and how much would that cost me, and how would that improve my robustness score? And that you can now do this across industries. You can do this across uh, organization within the same industry. Um, and that really helps organizations make decisions, but also from um, the regulator's perspective, it, it provides them the ability to really focus their, um, uh, their inspections uh, and the audits uh, and, and approving uh, financial spending uh, to know where that needs to go and, 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 and also report back on how that improved 
the robustness, but also how that improved um, uh, or the value added back to the consumers uh, from the money that was spent. So we're really excited about this this whole uh, uh, methodology. It's, it's not been done before. Uh, so uh, hopefully um, uh, in the alpha phase, we'll look to automate all of this as well. That's Thanks it. a lot, Mo. Um, we've got time for a couple of quick questions and we do have two in the Q&A. Uh, and the first being, what do you expect to be the innovations developed from cybersecurity perspective beyond business as usual OT cyber activities? Uh, so so uh, in terms of the innovation, as I explained, uh, it will be around creating, uh, I think primarily the methodology that's accepted that, that's never existed in um, uh, that would look at creating a number uh, because it's always been very difficult to explain cybersecurity to the board. Uh, to say why you want to make a change, why you want to spend the money. Uh, and so this, this tie back to the risk and the risk treatment and, and a number that uh, makes sense to the board will be, will be uh, uh, quite exciting. Um, Is that, that, that be a tool then? Yeah, yeah and, and the as well uh, in the well. DAU. And the other question is, do you think there's a place for quantum computation to aid cyber resilience and progress and processing capabilities for the energy networks? Sure. Um, so quantum computer, much like AI, is a tool. Uh, so I'm sure it has a place. Uh, we're not assessing the specific tools in this scenario uh, uh, because uh, there are, I mean, from a firewall to quantum computing, these are all the techniques and the tools that you can apply to um, to provide to security and resilience. And it should be based on a risk approach. So I'm sure it will, uh, based on a particular risk profile, have a place. And in the future, as you get more quantum uh, uh, computers adding to that risk profile, uh, there will be a place for it, but we're not really looking at it in, in this scenario, uh, in this, in this um, uh, innovation project. Brilliant. Maybe one to keep an eye on as um, things develop in that area. Thanks a lot, Mo. That's been um, really great. Thank you for sharing it with us. We'll move on now to Trinity, which is a UKPN-led project with GE and the University of Strathclyde. So over to you. Thanks for the introduction, um, David. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, my name is Nicola Huting. I work on behalf of uh, UK Power Networks as the project manager for Trinity. Um, so let me share with you what Trinity is and what problems we're trying to address. So DNOs are faced with more and more complex networks, as we all know, mostly driven by um, you know, the requirements to enable net zero. Um, this complexity is due to, for example, a larger number of assets connected to the network and more market participants. Um, so this makes the management and control of the distribution networks more challenging with new control points, failure modes, and sometimes conflicting priorities. Um, so to tackle this, new systems, control solutions, and operators will have to be introduced to the control room. However, this in turn is a challenge because control rooms aren't set up to evolve at the pace that's required. And that's true from a people, process and technology point of view. So Trinity is looking to address one of the fundamental reasons for this, which is the lack of a comprehensive network simulator. So existing simulation tools are either focused on the low level, meaning it's too resource intensive really and too error prone to perform complex simulations or in the case of simulators used in transmission networks, not comprehensive enough um, to mirror the complexity found in distribution networks. So the objective of Trinity is therefore to develop and deploy a simulator that allows control engineers to run robust and reliable simulations of their own networks. Um, it will allow them to simulate realistic and complex operational and commercial scenarios. Um, so at the end of Trinity, we, we really have um, three things um, that we're trying to get as an output. Um, Firstly, an environment to optimize operations, um, such that optimizing ADMS automation solutions. Um, secondly, a training facility for new staff, but also to train existing staff on increasingly complex scenarios. And thirdly, a sandbox environment that will allow um, trials, demos, and validations of innovative control room solutions uh, in a virtualized world. Um, next slide, please. 
So yeah, how have we approached this project? Um, so with UK Power Networks being the lead partner, we've partnered with um, PNDC and GE. So UK Power Networks will ultimately be the end user of the solution. PNDC, whose focus is on energy systems research, have relevant experience in this area uh, as they're running the control room of the future program. And um, GE, with their product Power On, which is an ADMS product uh, used by most of the DNOs in the UK, um, we are building on the existing proof of concept network simulators. So in discovery phase, we worked on four deliverables shown here. Um, the first one, we developed user requirements from a UKPN perspective. Second uh, deliverable was GE looking at different simulator, simulator architectures and um, architectures and designs and how each could meet our requirements. Um, so the third deliverable was a plan covering the validation and deployment of the simulator in subsequent phases, and that was um, developed by PNDC. And the last, um, last deliverable, um, GE basically created a strategic roadmap um, for an ADMS integrated simulator. Um, in terms of ways of working, there are a few things, um, there are a few learnings I would like to share. Um, firstly, we um, hugely benefited from an in-person workshop, uh, which GE kindly hosts at their facilities in Livingston. Um, and this provides a dedicated day for all of us to get together and align the requirements, the vision and the deliverables of the project. Um, secondly, significant coordination was required on some of the deliverables, so we um, ended up scheduling daily stand-ups, um, which hugely improved the communication between partners, so um, something I could recommend. And um, thirdly, we, you know, we made use of um, new technologies such as digital whiteboards and, and SharePoints to work on things collaboratively. Um, so I'll now hand over to Jack from UKPN's Control System Automation Team, and uh, he'll take us through the user requirements and benefits. Thanks, Nikolai. Uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, uh, so good morning, all. Um, so how do you go about meeting the problem of uh, control room uh, capabilities? Um, at UK Power Networks, um, we identify specific user requirements um, which fall under this broad umbrella of uh, testing and training. Um, the aim is to make it easier and quicker to train staff and uh, test the network, um, including uh, automation. So we uh, identified 24 uh, specific uh, business use case scenarios uh, for the simulator, which would help UK Power Networks go for this uh, control room in the future. Um, and these were based on current processes and tasks, um, but also trying to think about uh, potential future uh, requirements. And these are 24 uh, categories. Uh, Cases are um, grouped into six categories of um, application tools, uh, integration, network fault simulation, uh, plant failure, uh, real-time network simulation, and uh, protection scheme. Um, so I'll give you a, a, sort of a high level of a selection of these, um, one of them being um, integration. So whatever simulator solution that was going to be decided on, um, we wanted the, the platform to be uh, fully software-based and easily integrated um, with a replica of our existing uh, production ADMS environment um, without the need for complex um, middleware or configuration um, and for it to provide a realistic experience um, for the user and represent the, uh, the network um, that we'd like. Um, another linking on to this is uh, real-time simulation. So we want to be able to we need the simulator to reproduce the responses of, of the power system uh, to faults, switching controls, uh, manually entered events, schedules, um, protection operation and trips in real time. Um, and linking to this is our application tools. So um, having be able to have scenarios for automated testing, um, setting predefined network states um, and being able to, able to revert the network to a, a predefined um, situation. Um, then linking to this is um, looking at sort of the future and DSO and generation. Um, we want to be able to simulate distributed generation on the network um, and we want to be able to simulate increasing generation or reducing generation and see the effect on limiting uh, assets and the impact of uh, constraint management. Um, well, setting these requirements um, hopefully lead on to the benefits from having a simulator. Um, so next slide, please. 
So like I said before, uh, the user requirements cover fall into this of both training and testing. Um, should be able to give the benefits of um, when it's be easy to use. So be able to save uh, time and training. Uh, re reduction in complex integration. Um, so we can deploy it to a, a wider range of uh, staff. Um, time saved, um, integration and also how, how to actually use it and test certain scenarios and being able to replay events. So if there's a particular storm scenario that's happened, um, being able to replay that um, for testing the network, but also for tra training control engineers as well. Um, by setting out these requirements and the benefits, they lead on to sort of the ultimate aim of, of deferred reinforcement, um, reduce, uh, well, increase flexibility, um, and reducing uh, expenditure in the control room. Um, and this leads to the ultimate benefit um, to UK power network networks of uh, 138 million from 2023 to 2050. Um, so I'm now I'm going to hand over to John from G, who would discuss the um, simulator options to achieve this. Thanks, Jack. If we could have the next slide, please. Yes, so looking at um, the design and the different um, architectural options that, that we looked at for the simulator. I guess the first thing is if you look at the ADMS itself, um, so the ADMS has to have a network model that's um, modeled, um, holds, holds the network model, which has the connectivity as well as the electrical attributes that are shown within um, the, the assets of that network model. And then as it connects into the, the SCADA, it um, needs to have some uh, configuration that shows the linkage of the actual uh, um, SCADA that is out in the field and how that gets um, mapped back into the network model. So um, once the, the SCADA um, uh, is um, feeding information back into the um, ADMS, um, it will hold that in a real-time database. So it holds the, the, the current situation, the current state of the um, entire network um, and um, makes that available um, through displays for um, operators to visualize and take actions on. So what we looked at was uh, um, um, any simulator has to have um, the ability to get that network model out of the ADMS. It has to be able to configure scenarios that we that we want um, to either use for training or um, for testing new drops of software, for example, or new um, configurations of automation. And um, it has to then react um, and provide the inputs back to the operator that they would get in a, a realistic a situation. So we looked at two different ways of connecting the simulator in there. One is just through um, SCADA, so directly um, th through the SCADA interface. And the other one was actually using APIs of the um, ADMS itself. So being able to see more of the internal information within um, the ADMS. Um, so um, what we're looking at taking forward is um, option one. Um, so option two, connecting into the SCADA gave us the option of Flexibility, it's separate from the ADMS. Um, it gives that level of independence, um, but it does limit um, the ability to see um, what the operators are doing, as well as um, you know you would need to um, implement all of the um, SCADA protocols that um, all the network operators have to be able to simulate the whole network. Um, um, whereas with the API one, you have the ability to um, not only get the internal information, but also inject um, other interfaces, which are either from the enterprise systems um, or, or, for example, um, customer calls or smart meter events can be fed in and can be part of um, those scenarios that, that we talked about developing um, for the training and um, testing purposes. So um, I think the other thing that we looked at was the ability to rapidly take um, a version of the production instance, so sort of data cut from um, the control room into the simulator um, and with the least amount of work required to, to get that up and running and, and start people to start using that um, for training and, and um, testing. Um, so going forward, we're looking to take option one um, forward to an alpha um, submission. Um, and I'll now hand on to Kyle to talk through how we look at um, 
you're validating that. Thanks, John. Next slide, please. Uh, so John's talked about the simulator design in the last slide, and he's already said I'm going to present on how we will test and validate that design for the option one that's being taken forward. So the objective of the testing is to prove operation, test the higher risk elements of the simulator design, and validate the capability of the simulator against the use cases that were identified by UKPN and Deliverable 1. That's what Jack talked about earlier in the presentation. So the plan for testing and validation is to compare the response of the GE simulator established in Deliverable 2 with an external simulation environment, or in some cases, a test network response, as you can see in the diagram on the slide. So we are proposing that the first phase of testing and validation will utilize an established exemplar test network with published network data. For example, something like the IEEE 132 bus network model. This network can then be co-simulated in the GE ADMS simulator and the PNDC equivalent power system environment. For some use cases, this will of course require us to modify the exemplar model to be uh, used for testing either implemented outside of the modeling environment uh, or uh, tested in the real network. So either modifying the network model or implementing it in the real test network. So we've taken uh, in the discovery phase, the 24 use cases from deliverable one and identified the use cases that will be targeted for validation as well as defining the process for validation. An alpha phase validation will involve five phases. Uh, first, establishing detailed test scenarios, building on the discovery phase proposal, simulating the use cases to generate validation data, testing the prototype simulator to generate test data, comparing the two sources of data, and then disseminating the findings both to partners and external stakeholders. Based on the development of the GE simulator, it's very likely we'll implement an agile approach where the validation simulating uh, validation simulating uh, simulation simulating the use cases uh, will be implemented immediately prior to the GE functionality being ready for testing, uh, and it's likely we will implement multiple use cases in parallel for validation rather than following a sequential approach. So I'll pass back to Nikolai for the wrap up on the presentation. Hey, thanks, Kyle. Um, yes, yeah, so let me wrap up and share our vision for Alpha, Beta and beyond. Um, so our primary objective for Alpha is twofold. Um, first, we would like to deploy the core simulator into the production ADMS environment for one of UKPN's networks, and that's at 11 and 33 KB. Um, and basically, the aim is to provide user acceptance of the simulator and demonstrate value. Um, the roadmap below shows some of the fundamental use cases that we will be targeting in Alpha. Um, and secondly, uh, we would like to validate that the simulator is able to meet, like Kyle said, um, the requirements set out in the use cases, and this will provide credibility and highlight any strength and areas for improvement as well. Um, another work stream we're exploring is around demonstrating the route um, to operations for other DNOs, and as we've learned through discovery phase, um, certain prerequisites need to be true before there's a chance to successfully deploy a simulator, mostly around um, network connectivity and data available. Um, so our long-term goal for beta and beyond is to deploy the simulator across all voltage levels from LB to 132 uh, kV and across all of UKPN's networks. Um, in terms of the simulator functionality, we're looking at more complicated use cases for later phases of the project, um, such as utilizing the simulator network planning activities. And these are shown here on the right-hand side of the um, simulator roadmap. Um, some of the use cases require advanced integration with other control room components. Um, such as the ability to inject customer calls or smart meters, as mentioned by John earlier. Um, next slide, please. Yes, and yeah, that's that's it. I would like to thank uh, thank you for listening, and I'd like to thank our project partners and um, our other presenters today. And if you'd like to get in touch after the presentation, um, please reach out on one of the email addresses um, shown on the screen. Thanks, Nikolai. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the Q&A and a bit of time to answer them as well. So the first one is, how do you anticipate UKPN control room operations interfacing with the ESO control room, particularly where there might be competing requirements in future at different voltage levels of the power system? Yeah, I'll, I'll go with that. I think it's... Uh... Uh, quite a, a wide topic there that could uh, have its own uh, presentation um, but in terms of uh, the simulator I think it's that that, that being able to um, 
do the, do the, the simulation up to 132, um, setting different events and scenarios and seeing what the impact of that is. Um, and then obviously liaising with um, the SO of, of what the outcomes are, what's expected from that. I, I suppose there might be um, situations in future, particularly with more distributed generation, where you might have different fault risks on mm -hmm. the low voltage levels, whilst the SO is trying to manage at the um, highest transmission level. Exactly, yeah. Um, but giving that, giving us that flexibility to be able to model that. So maybe and worth also adding on to that, we're already thinking about, you know, future stakeholders integrating into the system and how that might be realized in later stages of the project or follow on. So, so yeah, thanks for that, Carl. And the second question is, do you anticipate the development of digital twins impact in the use of SCADA systems for your simulation or will the data for digi twin development come via UKPN SCADA systems to so I, I can maybe answer that, um, John McCartney here. Um, so essentially embedded inside the ADMS is a digital twin. So, so that, that connected network model um, is a digital twin of the, um, the whole network um, in terms of the plant items, in terms of connectivity. So I, I think depending what, what the question is asking about, in, if there's an external digital twin, there may be um, a, a question of synchronization. So making sure that um, any external digital twin is synchronized with the the, the network, the live network state. Um, and um, similarly, um, one of the options is looking at future network states. And so, you know, if you were talking about, you know, um, changes to the network and how you, know, you may be able to train on those or understand and test those, um, the simulator will provide some um, capabilities around that as well. Mm -hmm. And so will, will you be able to adapt the simulation down to quite a real time granularity from the data that you've got at the moment? Yes, it, it's not going to be um, well, you know, very real time in terms of, you know, um, it'll be within the, the bounds of, sort of SCADA real time. So, so the, 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 the responsiveness of that. Um, so what we're looking at is, is, you know, you will see on the screen what you would expect to see in a real life um, timing situation. So the, the responses will come back as if you're watching real time. Yes. Got it. And we've just had another question come in from Rob saying, is there an expectation to use these simulators to train operators and deal them with unexpected events, much like an airline trains pilots? Um, Yes, so ultimately is the uh, short answer. Um, but one of the requirements is being about um, setting up uh, sort of safe scenarios um, or like replaying a certain event. So if something's happened, being able to have that and then being able to, to replay that event, so to speak, and then see how people react to it. So it's all sort of set up and ready to go. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's all the questions we've got. So we'll leave it there. But thank you very much for your presentation and sharing your contact details so that anybody can follow up as necessary. We'll move on to the next presentation now, which is the Credo Plus Climate Resilience Demonstrator. So over to you, James and Elliot. Thanks, David. And hello. Um, so yeah, James, it's me again, uh, Innovation Project Manager at UK Power Networks and Show and Tell for Credo Plus project, which is aptly named because it's an extension to the existing Credo Climate Resilience Demonstrator, um, which I encourage you people to go and have a look at, um, which is something that's already available for, for visibility on. This is a really exciting and innovative project that will provide self-serve modeling functionality in the hands of network planners so that they can identify uh, the impact of future extreme weather events. Um, so I'm, I'm going to hand over um, to Elliot Christou, who's from Connected Places Catapult, to take you through all of the exciting details um, in terms of the, the project and, and the, uh, the problem and the, the solution that we're proposing. Uh, and he's going to bring it all to life. So over to you, Elliot. Thanks, James. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Elliot Christou. I've been the technical lead from Connected Places on this project, uh, along with our other partners, uh, STFC, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, and CMCL, who have both been doing a lot of the technical work over the years on Credo. 
Next slide, please. So climate change, as we've already heard from, from various other projects, is expected to increase in severity and frequency of weather events. And we're already seeing that with the recent events like Storm Marlin and last year's heat wave. Along with the climate risks to individual assets and sites, there is also a growing awareness from the likes of the National Infrastructure Commission, the Committee on Climate Change, and the Joint Committee on National Security Strategy, as well as others, that we have a lack of understanding of the cascading risk of our connected infrastructure systems. And it's been highlighted that the energy sector is a part of many of these infrastructure interdependencies. Next slide, please. To answer this, Credo aims to be a climate change adaptation digital twin that connects across organizations and sectors. By breaking down data sharing and sector silos, we can collectively understand cascading risk and how to improve overall system resilience and robustness so that we can make better coordinated decisions at the lowest cost. For the past couple of years, Connected Places has been funding and running a demonstrator project in partnership with UK Power Networks, as well as Anglian Water and BT Group to model their combined electricity, water, telecoms network, which is shown on the right here. And we've also been looking in particular at how it responds to flooding events. With our system-wide impact modeling, we can, for example, see how localized flooding could shut down a primary substation and this could lead to loss of power to a secondary substation. In turn, this could cascade across sectors to stop providing power to telephone exchanges and water boosters, potentially meaning a loss of electricity, water and telecoms to customers. And of course, there'll be knock on feedback effects into the energy system. Next slide, please. So we've been working with partners across research and industry to tackle the social and technological challenges of digital twinning, like data sharing, as well as impact, economic and decision modeling. Our overall goal is to scale Credo up. So we've developed a distributed data architecture, which you can see in front of you. And at the heart of that, and at the heart of Credo is an extensible knowledge graph technology so that we can scale to more network operators and their different assets as well as different geographies, different use cases and climate events, and also make the system interoperable with other technologies. Next slide, please. As Barry Hatton, Director of Asset Management at UKPN said in our recent film, the more participants, the better our understanding of the interaction between networks and the impact of cascading risk. And so our overall goal with SIF is to scale across the energy sector with the aim of building it out to business as usual when it comes to climate change adaptation, decision-making for resilience, robustness, and cascading risk. Next slide, please. Now I wanna give you a flavor of how Credo works and we'll go on to talk about the extensions we've proposed as part of Credo Plus. So it all starts with data from different asset owners being combined into the Credo knowledge graph and you can think of this knowledge graph as like a connected database. From here, we feed in geographical weather data, like the height of the flood, to understand how each asset in the network is locally impacted with our asset impact models. Then we can run our system-wide models that cascade any failures or impacts through the rest of the connected networks. We could then use economic models to determine costs of the event to operators and wider society, and decision intelligence to identify coordinated mitigation strategies like co-investment in better flood defenses at critical sites. Their data and insights are then, of course, fed back to the users. They can be visualized with map and dashboard visualizations. We were really happy with the, uh, with the results, but we identified a scaling issue. Next slide, please. So these asset impact models actually require eliciting tacit information from experts like asset engineers and managers through workshops. And this is fine for research and demonstrator purposes, but it's not scalable in the long term for our network and system-wide ambitions. Next slide, please. So you might be asking why we've taken this expert-led approach to model building. Well, it's important to point out that whilst there may be records of historic failure data, a lot of the time, this type of granular information is not easily accessible in data systems, or it simply doesn't exist because the events do not happen often enough or may not have happened yet. 
And as we've heard from others about sample size and, and issues around that, this sparsity can make purely data-driven approaches like off-the-shelf machine learning applications a bit of a challenge. Next slide, please. So as described, the Credo approach is to work with experts to build the asset models. But traditionally, these sessions need to be carried out by specialists like industrial mathematicians and require valuable time from asset engineers. The output of a series of workshops is what's called a probabilistic Bayesian network model. And this will capture the likelihood and risk structure to an asset or site, including what it's dependent on in the more of this network sense and any mitigation strategies. Next slide, please. So for Credo Plus, what we've proposed is to create a digital elicitation tool that puts the building of these asset models directly in the hands of the asset managers and engineers. And with this, we'll be able to scale across networks and across different climate scenarios. Next slide, please. So now here is the proposed Credo Plus workflow with the extensions in orange. The idea we've been testing is that asset managers will build the model structures and then distribute a related digital questionnaire to engineers and other experts so that they can validate and fill in the parameters of the model. And these parameters will then be stored and aggregated, et cetera, et cetera. It's important to note that where historic data does exist, it can be combined with the expert opinions to make stronger inferences. So the output of the elicitation tool will be a growing hierarchical library of asset models for different weather events that could be generic to either a class of assets or bespoke to individual assets. These models can then be made available to the Credo technology and workflow that I talked through, but could also be integrated into existing risk management software, such as things like CNAME. Next slide, please. I'm now gonna go on to give an overview of our discovery phase activities, which we ran as an agile feasibility study to prepare for a small scale end-to-end -end demonstration. We worked in two week sprints with bi-weekly standups and a longer combined retro and planning session all managed by connected places. We also worked collaboratively on a single SharePoint protected by multi-factor authentication and hosted by UKPN. So all findings were kept secure. Network data and engineering expertise was provided throughout by UKPN, and the rest of the team worked collaboratively across organizations to understand more about the assets, their vulnerability, how it impacts could cascade, and all the data that's available. They, we also looked at whether the elicitation tool was the right fit for UKPN and for scaling across the energy sector. And we also looked at how we would integrate and extend the Credo technology. Next slide, please. So as I've talked about, next slide, please. So as I've talked about, we've already made some good progress with flooding. And so we're keen to extend to other climate risks with the SIF project. What we found from early workshops with the asset managers was that extreme heat is an emerging risk that is poorly understood. In particular, Sophie Mott, head of asset strategy at UKPN, thought this risk was in need of innovation and the Credo Plus approach was the right fit due to a lack of historic data and the complex interdependencies, such as the derated network capacity, combined with the added demand from things like air conditioning during bouts of extreme heat. So we identified four main classes of vulnerable assets that impacted in different ways and found that the underlying modeling principles are slightly different from our previous flooding use case. So this will all be a good test of the extensibility, extensibility of the Credo technology stack. Next slide, please. We also conducted workshops and data requests to map out UKPN private and open data holdings and identified the data sources relevant to the project. Next slide, please. We conducted background research on climate and weather data and found that the UKCP projections are suitable for all of our early prototyping needs. But we also engaged with climate experts who might be needed for bespoke data in the future when there is more targeted use cases, such as including cooling effects of wind and soil temperature. 
Next slide, please. From our user research, we identified that asset managers and engineers are the main users, and that we need to codify vulnerability knowledge through the digital elicitation tool. But that the outputs from these risk models and the outputs from Credo are much more broadly relevant to strategic planning and data teams. Next slide, please. We produced a full visual mock-up of the digital elicitation tool that captures the user requirements we identified. For the model builder shown in the top right here, this includes the need for a low or no code solution through some sort of graphical interface. So we've also mapped this into the technical requirements and identified existing technologies that we will test out in the next phase. It's worth noting that for the demonstrator, we will of course be building out only the core functionality for testing and validating with users instead of building a full production ready tool. So it won't look quite as impressive as what the team has mocked up here. Next slide, please. So in summary, we are extending to the extreme heat use case and have mapped out the asset and system vulnerabilities as well as modeling requirements. We know where to get the asset data and we know where to get the climate data. And the technical team have concluded that it's feasible to integrate and extend the existing Credo technology. Next slide, please. So Credo Plus is expected to bring a broad range of benefits to network operators, their customers and wider society. Previously, Frontier Economics focused on assessing the benefits of an improved understanding of infrastructure interdependencies and how that will impact the strategic planning for resilience and robustness use case. They simulated that the expected benefits for the case of flooding over the investment period of up to 2050 are estimated for Credo at around 100 million over the UK. They also found that Credo would deliver a, a higher level resilience across the system at a lower cost relative to a counterfactual where there was only siloed resilience planning. Future work is, of course, needed to quantify the benefits of the extreme heat use case, as well as some of the benefits such as improved response, integrated adaptation reporting and price reviews, as well as other spillover effects such as better collaboration and information sharing between organizations, improved data quality and better awareness of climate change impacts. Next slide, please. Our next steps are listed here. In addition to the technical work, we'll also be doing a lot more stakeholder engagement across the energy sector because we really need to test out our scaling and demand assumptions, as well as building out the business case. Next slide, please. And I wanted to finish by highlighting some of the complementary activities we're up to as our ultimate ambitions are to scale across sectors. So I'm pleased to share that we're in the process of kicking off a project with Angling Water and other partners funded by the Offbot Catalyst Stream to explore connected extreme heat use cases in the water sector. This is of course highly complementary and we're already feeding in some of our learnings from this discovery phase and expect to of course get those back as well. As well as this at Connected Places, we're using our core Innovate UK grant to explore the cross-sector use cases for integrated infrastructure technologies and advancing towards an interoperable digital and data sharing ecosystem, which I'm showing on the right here. I think this is where a lot of the, the interoperability comes in and where different types of modeling approaches could be combined throughout the different use cases. Next slide, please. So thank you for your time today and to the other projects that we've discussed with over the discovery phase. If you're interested in finding out more, please get in touch or go to the digitaltwinhub.co.uk forward slash credo for more information. So happy to answer any questions and I might be drawing on my colleague Stefan for any further thoughts. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Elliot, for a um, very thorough presentation. Well done for getting through all those slides. Um, <laughs> we're still waiting for questions to come in at the moment, but I was wondering if you could just share any um, learnings from leveraging different funding routes um, with the project as well. It's something that we're really enthusiastic about seeing, and it's great to hear that there is this being used between your core grants and the water sector. But sort of what are the challenges to practically doing that? 
Yeah, so I, I think the, the first one is, of course, around that they both need similar types of climate data if we're focusing on extreme heat for both. So as I said, like we're, we're taking on a lot of that, that learnings and all of the research that we've already done and the different uh, experts that we we talked to over over the discovery phase around what what would be needed for for more advanced climate data beyond just UKCP stuff. I think the other thing that's interesting is around our modeling approach. So in in the like earlier work that we've done around flooding, that's a lot more to do with uh, you know, flooding is a very direct impact. So, you know, if something gets wet, it has to it has to be turned off uh, and it is down for a while. Whereas with something like heat, where it's a lot less understood, I think it's it's in part because it's a much more like prolonged process. So it's more about you know multiple days or weeks where where an asset is experiencing experiencing high temperatures as opposed to you know like a an immediate effect from from a flood uh, and this kind of a approach will obviously be taken as well and shared between between both projects because we're looking for this kind of extensibility and interoperability we'll be looking for that kind of meta modeling approach that can be applied to all different types of assets across sectors so otherwise like it's it's not going to scale yeah i got it so you'd actually relate quite a lot to the technical approach to the project as well exactly um we've got a couple of questions that have come in now one how do you anticipate the ownership or commercial usage of the credo model work in is this something that the network owns or is it provided on a licensed basis yeah, this is a good question. And I think one that, that comes up a lot, I guess it, it also relates to the kind of who pays question. So connected places are of course a, a, a not-for-profit and um, this is really something where we're, we're just pushing the technology and we're exploring all different avenues. There are various cases that this could take. And of course at this stage, it's where we're seeking to leverage innovation funding could see that it's something that that is like a software as a service model that network operators pay for and this is, is something that we're exploring uh it could also be something that's more owned by by government and regulators and it feeds more into things like adaptation reporting and price reviews and having a, a consistent approach across that to understanding risk um they're obviously like by private sector options around insurance and stuff like that but for, for the moment, you know, we're just exploring those. And that's part of our kind of other work that we're doing. Brilliant. We'll be interested to see how that develops then. It feels like there could be some good learnings for other projects as well. Um, we've got a question from Steph Church, which is what approaches are to be used where there's less knowledge around some assets? Have you found any particular data gaps? Uh, so what we what we have found is more that there's not uh, a lack of knowledge about the assets but there's more like a lack of machine readable knowledge about the assets you know the the data isn't like tabulated or, or well digitized you know you, you hear a lot about how uh resilience planning and things like that that is still maybe as a, a pdf uh and and that obviously makes it a lot tougher that's kind of why we've taken this approach of eliciting the the knowledge directly from the experts you know from the, the people with the boots on the ground that really know their sites and know intricacies that would actually be quite hard to to capture digitally. Um, and of course, the asset managers have, have a, a good handle on this as well. And these are the people that we've been discussing with over the, the kind of discovery phase. Mm -hmm. so maybe uh, maybe I can add a couple of things as well. I'm, I'm Stefan, data strategist from the Connected Places uh, Catapult as well. So I think the, the couple of things to also consider is that this uh, elicitation methodology that we're aiming to use as a base to develop what, what Elliot was just presenting a minute ago is, is at, at the root of it, is based on collaboration. So there's no reason if you feel as an organization that you lack the expertise to perhaps produce a good quality model that you couldn't necessarily find uh, that expert knowledge 
by collaborating with with some other organizations that perhaps you have collaborated in the past for other projects so that could be academia or, or other things and one of the things perhaps to mention here is that they're aware that probably hotter climates around the globe have more expertise on some of these heat uh, event kind of impacts knowledge and for example we've got a virtual run table uh, schedule for later in the month with uh, some of our contacts in the power sector in the US via some of our or, or some of our academic partners where where we're hoping to learn more and and start to investigate these kind of like collaborative approaches but I think that's that's an interesting one and plus also you know credo has been designed from its initial stages to be extensible and flexible so I think you know as a project we're also very interested to see what all the projects are doing in, in this sort of space. And, you know, there shouldn't be a particular reason why there could be different kinds of models involved for different kinds of things should it be needed. So that's also one thing that that I think uh, we would be quite quite keen to to understand and collaborate with with others in the future should should the need for, for this sort of like uh, question arise for some of the use cases. But yeah, thank you, sorry. Brilliant. Thanks a lot for that. And you probably answered the final question, was, which was, are there any international studies from hotter climates, e.g. Australia, that could feed into extreme use cases? It sounds like, yes, there are. And uh, you're interested to talking to people where some expert knowledge could be shared. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll move on to the next presentation now because um, we're running just a couple of minutes behind. So this is the final presentation in this show and tell section. It's Comms Connect. Um, the University of Strathclyde will be presenting, but again, this is a UKPN sponsored project as well. So over to you. Thank you, David. So yes, uh, as you mentioned, it's a UKPN led project where we've been looking at resilient communication networks. Uh, click, please. So we've been hearing an awful lot about storms today, where you've got fallen trees, severe weather, and, and flooding. Uh, click, please. And what happens in all of those situations, we reach for our phones and that connectivity. And that's no different than restoration engineers, um, where they're trying to coordinate um, both with each other and central control centers, um, to sort of coordinate that response. And that was actually discovered in Storm Marwin, where although DNOs do have their own independent message of communication, very often uh, restoration engineers first of all reach for their phones because it's what they were used to, it's what they're familiar with, and it has increased tools such as picture messaging, um, which can help alleviate the problem and increase that coordination, sending new configuration files over a data connection. Next slide, please. Another example of where this communication is required is here, and um, where we've got a small town here, detailed in the top left picture, where a tree has fallen on the line between points four and three. Um, and this causes an electrical fault, which then causes the power to the entire town to go out. Um, and But then in the third picture, we can see that the power has been able to be restored from the bottom left hand side through points one, two, and three. Um, and in the fourth picture on the other side, through substation B, through points five, uh, six, and four. And the other thing which is required to, to achieve this is communication. And so a signal will go out to each of those points, say, are you still operational? Yes, I am. Sent back to the connection control center, which is able to enable things like automatic power restoration and reduce the number of customer minutes lost by reducing the, the number of people affected. Next slide, please. So and if we look towards future applications, we've got things like wind farms, solar, um, and EV chargers, um, or sort of DER devices, battery storage. Um, click, please. And you guess that that all requires connectivity as well. And that's much more of that sort of smart grid that we've all been talking about, that interconnectivity in order to balance that demand uh, and supply. Next slide, please. So how is all this communication achieved? Um, with, throughout various different DNOs and network operators, there are different methods. Uh, so we've got satellite, which is generally quite high cost, low bandwidth. And we've got wireless mobile. So that could be private wireless mobile or public wireless mobile, um, which is generally 
one set of infrastructure spread over a wide geographical area to provide connectivity to lots of different assets. Um, on the public side of things, that can be very low cost since it's already using existing infrastructure. On the private side, um, it can be higher cost, but still lower cost than providing a dedicated satellite link to each site. You've also got technologies such as microwave, which can provide point to point or point to multi point. That has the advantages of being wireless and relatively low cost to install, but does still require that dedicated infrastructure. You've got ADSL, and which is really great from a resilience perspective because there is built power resilience into the network. And um, so there was power autonomy if the power went out, that communications network was still available. Unfortunately, it's been switched off in 2025, so we can't rely on that one much longer. And finally, we've got fiber optic, which is the way uh, the technology is going. Uh, so this provides a massive amount of capacity, um, but it's also relatively expensive to install. Um, and there's an ongoing debate um, about the power autonomy that's going to be put into that network, whether it will match the ADSL network um, and how far it will penetrate into it, whether it will only go to street cabinet or will it actually go to the, the premise at the end because to, in order for fiber optics to work, unlike ADSL, it requires powered infrastructure, which would require backup. For resilience, we would ideally want two of these different technologies to provide independent communication links. But of course, we want to do this in the most cost-effective manner as possible. Next slide, please. So looking at some cost and compensation, um, during Storm Arwen, uh, £46 million pounds was paid out in compensation. Uh, or part of that could have been reduced by a faster restoration, which could have been assisted by the control engineers being able to use their mobile phones, because what was discovered in, by two DNOs, engineers reached for the phones, but because the power to the mobile infrastructure had went down, the mobile infrastructure didn't work. And therefore, they couldn't effectively coordinate, slowing down the response. Without communications, it's also harder to do automatic power restoration. And so some of that compensation uh, could have been reduced through increased connectivity. Uh, one organization, looking more on the cost side of things, one organization um, has proposed in their Rio 2 uh, ED2 proposal, 5.5 million pounds in looking at private mobile radio communications. Um, this is sort of still analog technology, so you wouldn't be get any of the benefits of picture messaging or sending data configurations over that. Uh, second organization has proposed 1.5 million pounds to provide IP communications to 500 primary substations. Third organization has seen costs of up to 100,000 providing IP connectivity to certain substations. And a fourth organization has estimated about once £10,000 for an installation plus £120 monthly ongoing cost for providing that resilient IP connectivity to DNO assets. So once you start adding those costs up to the 6,400 primary substations and a subset of the roughly 400,000 secondary and some subset of the DER sites, that goes into the hundreds of millions of pounds to providing connectivity to each of these sites and enabling that sort of smart infrastructure. And um, next slide, please. So how can we reduce the costs? One of the ways of reducing the costs is by using public infrastructure. And that's been demonstrated by some DNOs who are using existing public infrastructure. Uh, the costs are substantially less uh, using uh, public 4G than using uh, ADSL or uh, satellite. Um, but the challenge that multiple DNOs find is that is there's a lack of oversight and, vis and visibility of those public networks. They don't know what exactly is going on in them. They don't know how much resilient they are. They don't know when the connectivity will go down. So can a compromise between these two things happen? So one example of that um, is this FirstNet, which is a network deployed by AT&T in the United States of America, which was a network built for emergency responders um, where they have priority communications. So there's dedicated infrastructure just for them to provide resilience, but they also use a lot of public infrastructure. And that reduces the cost quite significantly to order of magnitude, same price as what a regular consumer would pay sort of $30, $40 per month per site. Um, ESN, Emergency Services Network, is equivalent in the UK. 
um, where we're deploying, replacing Airwave um, and deploying a 4G network uh, for the blue light services to utilize. Um, and that's using the existing infrastructure rather than replacing uh, with a new system similar to Airwave. And that is predicted to save 200 million pounds per year. Um, so how can we bring together those two issues, the low cost um, of using public infrastructure, but the lack of visibility um, and other issues such as industry consolidation. So although there's four um, mobile network operators or NMOs in the UK, and that's actually broken down into two main groups, uh, Vodafone and O2, which uh, form Cornerstone, and Three and EE, which form CTEL. So in these agreements, they will share infrastructure, which then reduces the overall resilience. So even if you think you have the availability of four networks, you actually might only have the availability of two or one network. Um, and additionally on that, there's talk of a merger between Vodafone um, and three. So if that merger goes through, uh, then that would only become three or potentially one and a half networks. Um, looking forward in time, also looking at new data consumption profiles, uh, where as time goes on, uh, utilities may use more data consumption um, and therefore require more resources, and that might require rescoping of the communication requirements. And finally, looking at the potential coverage issues. So for an urban DNO, where there's already demand uh, for the mobile network operators to provide connectivity, connectivity for the primary customers, um, i.e. consumers, users like you and me, um, they will have that massive infrastructure, but up in rural areas, they might not have that massive infrastructure because there's no commercial incentive for them to provide it. Um, and therefore, it's difficult for a DNO to provide uh, one solution for the entire network area if they don't have that required coverage. Next slide, please. So one of the areas which we've been looking into is, can we reduce that dependence on public infrastructure or lack of availability, of visibility on public infrastructure and increase the information exchange between network DNOs and mobile network operators? Um, and there's actually a lot of supporting work in this area. And um, so as Project Guido mentioned, the readiness for storm ahead um, by the Joint Committee on National Security Strategy highlighted this interdependence uh, between electricity networks and communication infrastructure and suggested it's an area that should be investigated. The Electronic Communications Resilience and uh, Response Group, um, which has members such as CPNI, uh, the Home Office, the Cabinet Office, and then DCMS also published a report after Storm Irwin, which mean one of the main findings was the critical independency between communications and power infrastructure. Um, so how can we solve that interdependency? It's through allowing greater information exchange, giving the DNOs more oversight over to what the MNOs networks are capable of, and I'm giving the MNOs more insight about what the DNOs um, can provide. So there is a technical standard um, provided by the 3GPP, which is the Mobile Networks uh, Standards Organization, um, which is looking at providing exactly that, providing additional information for DNOs uh, from uh, mobile network operators, such as um, if this mass site goes out, uh, then these are all the assets which will lose communications. Um, or if, if the power goes out, out uh, this mass site will have 15 minutes of battery backup or one hour of battery backup or four hours of battery backup. Therefore, enabling the DNO to prioritize restoration to certain areas which might lose communications faster than others um, in order for them to effectively respond to the disaster. Similarly, uh, there's a lot of work going on in the EU at the moment, um, where some new regulation is coming out looking exactly at reducing interdependency between communications and utility infrastructure. Um, and based on that, there's a lot of interest from both the DNOs, such as uh, EDF, um, and the MNOs, such as Vodafone and Deutsche Telekom, um, in order to enable this reducing interdependency and collaboration. Next slide, please. So specifically for our alpha objectives, um, we want to 
integrate uh, the DNO and MNO, so mobile network operators, systems, and a proof of concept demonstrator. Um, just and it's sort of as I outlined before, and um, we're detailing to an MNO, sorry, a DNO, uh, what assets will lose connectivity if that MNO asset goes out, and therefore providing more information to the DNO and for allowing them to make informed decisions. Uh, click, please. There's another aspect of tackling the similar problem um, is using the facility at PNDC, where we have two 5G networks, a private network and a public network, and we have DNO infrastructure such as PowerOn, uh, where we can create a system where alerts from the mobile network operator, for example, Walls of Mains, and is fed out to that system and into PowerOn to allow control and restoration engineers to have a fuller picture of what's going on. We would develop a test bed to show that and um, explore the challenges of about the integration with the various different partners in the ecosystem. So that's things like uh, Nokia and Ericsson on the mobile telecoms side of things um, or PowerOn um, on the DNO side of things. Um, and since this is an open facility, which is partly funded by our member organizations, uh, DNOs would be able to, to come and visit the site and, and see how exactly their system could be integrated to make it work best for them. Click, please. Um, as an additional way of tackling this problem, um, or we wanted to de-risk the approach as much as possible, would be creating a small monitoring device, which could be de uh, deployed in substations to monitor the surrounding networks. Um, and if a network was to go down that can be sent back to a centralized database and then um, compared against uh, historical power outages or power outages at the time to sort of reverse engineer a uh, resilience map of the surrounding base stations. For example, in the diagram, there are two street level masks um, at the lower end of the picture, which might provide one hour of battery backup and therefore the power can go out and communications will maintain for one hour. However, the mass mounted at the top of the building, uh, at the top of the diagram, because of space, cost, um, and weight limitations, might not have any battery backup. And therefore, any devices connected to that mast uh, would lose communication instantly, where devices connected to the other mast would be able to keep communicating. Um, and by developing a device like this, um, we would be able to understand independently what the resilience of the communication network is in different areas of the network and therefore uh, decide intelligently where more resilience is required. For example, if there are four masks, each with a sufficient battery backup um, in that area, it may not require any additional resilient uh, infrastructure, where if there's only one mask with no battery backup infrastructure, it may be worth putting resilient communications or backup communications in the form of a satellite. Uh, next slide, and then I think we're on to questions and answers. Thanks a lot, Ross. Um, we haven't had any questions come in yet, but I've got one quick one. I know in other sectors like rail and road transportation, they proactively engaged in the development of 5G. Yes. Is there a history of the energy sector actually trying to influence the development of future communication systems to, uh, to meet the needs of the sector? Historically, it's not been very successful. It is an area that both uh, the GRC and uh, the UK is interested in pursuing. And um, it's one of the strategic objectives in order to get more influence over those standards. Um, so it's really good that this one area has actually made it to the start of that standardization process because that's how you can get things into the ecosystem where first of all needs to go into standards through the standardization process and then taken up by uh, vendors such as Nokia and Ericsson and then uh, once it's implemented by them then actually deployed by the mobile network operators. And uh Another question I had was around communications from DERs. Have you considered the sort of consumer consent and requirements that might be around that and or any user acceptance testing to know if people are actually going to be willing to have their devices communicating with um, an energy network or other organization? 
I think that depends on the level of DNR device that you're going to, um, where if you've got a relatively large wind farm, that would be a, a sort of a business agreement. Uh, but if you're thinking DER down to the, the fridge or the EV charger um, in a consumer's house, uh, then that is sort of different approaches. Um, using the public infrastructure for the latter, uh, so a device in a consumer's house, would be possible. Um, but I imagine that would be implemented through some sort of flexibility services where there is an incentive for them um, to uh, be connected to the grid. So in high periods of electricity, um, they might shut off and in low periods, they would get a lower price. So you'd be looking at bigger assets or the aggregation of smaller assets via an aggregator or other intermediary anyway? Uh, we're predominantly looking at the most cost-effective way of providing communications to any asset, which would be useful for a, D, uh, a DNO or DR provider. Um, but generally, yes, uh, larger assets um, is what we had in scope. And because it's the smaller assets, and um, if they were to lose power, it wouldn't cause such effect on the grid stability where if a large wind farm went out, it would. Great. We've just got one question, if you could quickly answer it before we wrap up. Are you planning on to work with communication standards agencies such as ETSI or NIST? Yes, we've had uh, lots of communications with uh, ETSI. Um, and yes, we would be working uh, or following the NIST standards um, with regards to cybersecurity. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Ross. And that wraps, wraps up the last presentation of the session. If we could just move on to the next slide. So we are moving through the whole um, series of show and tells at the moment. We've got over 50 projects in the discovery phase. This afternoon, we'll be coming back for our session around improving system efficiency and operational asset efficiency. We've then got a couple of sessions later in the week, which are really around flexibility, both uh, smart systems and heat networks, as well as flexibility for heat decarb before moving on to cross-vector approaches for decarbonisation of transport later in the week. We've got our final three sessions next week, running Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, which will be looking at supporting a just energy transition, local energy systems and a robust deliverability of net zero. If you could please share any of the registration links, which um, are in the slides, but you would have had them for joining this webinar as well with any of your and networks that might be interested in joining and we'll see you back at some of the future ones thank you all very much for joining and um, we will be publishing the recording on the youtube channel and the slides will be made available as necessary as well thank you all for your time and good luck with your alpha applications <laughs>